for 30 years, one name has been synonymous with this Daytona 500, Petty. And again this year, it is one of the major stories. This incident on Thursday in one of the twin 125 mile per hour qualifiers, Here's Richard Petty losing control. The wind pulled right out from beneath his car, spinning down the back straightaway, coming to a halt, having to stand on his time, and relegated to the 34th starting position for today's race. He'll have to come from out back, as will Cale Yarborough. Standing by with Richard Petty is Mike Joy. Richard, you're laughing, but maybe a little nervous. What have we learned since Thursday that'll help you as you try to march your way to the front and keep the back end of this thing on the ground? Well, you know, we don't know. I knew that not to get in the same position I got in Thursday. So uh, you know, it's going to be pretty tough uh, to get up through a crowd like this, but they're going to come back this way faster, and I'm going to go that way. So we just have to be careful. And it's a lot more fun watching them go to the front than watching them fade back. Petty and Cale Yarborough spun in their races. Now there's 11 Daytona 500 wins between them. There's another fellow back here who's won two of these races, and he's here for a different reason. Dave? Three years in a row, Bill Elliott has started on the pole. First place in this race. Today, he starts in 31st. And, Bill, you're not known as a push-and-shove pack racer. You like to pick your way through the field when you have to go to the front. But can you afford to be conservative today? Well, is there any other way? Is this a 500-mile race? So many things can happen. And if you're not there at the end, you can't win the race. Are you willing to push and shove if it takes that to get to the front? Well, let's put it this way. When it comes down to it, maybe. But, you know, I'm just going to try to to be conservative, be careful. And the main thing is, we, I know it's a 500 mile race. You know, I got some good competition, you know, good competitors back here with me. So maybe we can work together and get to the front. Kenny's accustomed to being the engineer on these Daytona freight trains, but as it stands right now, he's gonna have to start this race in the caboose. Ken? Thank you, David. Grand Marshal Dolph Van Arks, President and Chief Operating Officer of R.J. Reynolds, is about to give the command that will turn the field loose for 500 miles. Gentlemen, start your engines. starting lineup for the 30th annual Daytona 500. On the pole at 193 miles an hour from Benton, Missouri, Ken Schrader, alongside 26-year-old Davey Allison. In row two, the two-time winner, Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip. In row three, it's Rusty Wallace and defending Winston Cup champion Dale Earnhardt. For row four, New York's Greg Sachs and Texas' Terry Labonte. In row five, Bobby Hillen from Texas and from Mississippi, Lake Speed. In row six, Morgan Shepard and Sterling Marlin, number 44. Row seven is Rick Wilson out of Bartow, Florida, and Neil Bonnet still mending from a crash last year. Row eight, Jeff Bodine, the 86 champion, and Wisconsin's Alan Kowicki. In row nine, the 72 champion, A.J. Foyt, and the 80 winner, Buddy Baker. In row 10, Phil Parsons and the Bandit, Harry Gant. Row 11 sees Kyle Petty and from Spanaway, Washington, Derek Cope. Row 12 is Eddie Bear Swale and Michael Waltrip, Daryl's little brother. Row 13, Phil Barkdahl and Rick Jeffrey from Kentucky. Row 14 is Ricky Rudd with Kenny Bernstein's team this year and Canadian Trevor Boyce. Row 15, Dave Marcus from Wisconsin and Connie Saylor. Row 16, defending champion Bill Elliott and the four-time winner, Cale Yarborough. Row 17, Brad Teague and the seven-time winner, Richard Petty. Row 18, it's Steve Moore from Georgia and Dale Jarrett. Row 19, Jimmy Smut Means from Alabama and Mark Martin in the new Roush Ford. Row 20 is Ralph Jones and Ed Pym. The provisional starters, Danny Parsons, 41st, and from New York, Brett Bodine. We're with you live here at the Daytona 500, and you're looking at Davey Allison's car number 28, 
which failed to fire and now is just picking up speed carrying one of our CBS onboard cameras for our live coverage of the great American race. As he started to come out, something to miss, and he's had his troubles. Last night in the final moments of practice, he tagged the wall at turn two. There you see in the brown jacket, Dick Beatty, NASCAR inspector, and with him, Harry Rainier, the car owner, Robert Yates, asking for permission to work on the car, which they did. At 4 o'clock this morning, they were in replacing the side panels on the machine. Uh, Allison crashed in yesterday's practice and damaged the right front corner of the car and bent the frame. Ken, there's 105 man hours of repair work have gone into getting this car ready since 5 o'clock last night. There has to be some anxious moments when he goes into that first turn the first time at full speed, not knowing exactly how it's going to handle. Did they get it back together exactly the way they had it? Everyone has their fingers crossed on that team. Well, joining me topside this year is the Dean of American Race Casters, old Chrissy Konomaki, Ned Jarrett alongside, and David Hobbs has a brand new assignment for today. David? Well, Ken, the Daytona 500 is a very special race, not just for the drivers, because this is the big one in the NASCAR circuit, but also for the fans. NASCAR does seem to breed a particularly loyal type of fan, and we've got one or two right here with us, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas from Huntsville, Alabama. Just how long have you been coming to the Daytona 500? This is my 35th year, 30 years on the track and five at the beach. You come from Huntsville, Alabama, so who are your favorites for this race? Well, I'd have to say that I'll be pulling for one of the Alabama gang. This race is going to be very, very competitive this year. Do you think one of the Alabama gang can win it, or do you think somebody else is really going to win this race? I think the Alabama gang, someone in the Alabama game, has a good chance of winning. How much do these seats cost you, Mr. Thomas? These were relatively cheap seats at $40 each. However, it puts you down with the action, and I like them very much. Well, in the immortal words of Crocodile Dandy, that's a fan. Ken, back to the race. And we'll be back for the start of the 30th annual Daytona 500 live here on CBS following these messages. Well done, David. St. Louis, Missouri's Rusty Wallace, Rusty Ken Squire here at CBS Control. Do you hear us? Yeah, there it is, Ken. Go ahead. How do you feel right now, half a lap away from starting the million and a half Daytona 500? Oh, I'm right now, Ken. As far as Neil, I go, expect a good Daytona 500. You've got the leading Pontiac in the field. Are you going to charge and go right to the front? Are you going to stay right where you are for a while? Well, I'm going to try to see what happens to start this race. I think I'll try to get there front, get out of the traffic, and try to get up front. Have a great afternoon, Rusty. The field today is an interesting field, Chris. I would think so. There's 21 of the new downsized General Motors cars in the field, 10 season Fords and 10 season Chevrolets. And as I said earlier, these new cars have not been handling very well. One of the problems is they tested among themselves. They didn't get to test with the other make cars, so the draft is a question. Chevrolet has won this race five times, and there you see the number 25 of Ken Schrader on the pole. Crew chief is Harry Hyde, qualified at 193.823 miles per hour. And flanking him is 26-year-old Davey Allison, carrying one of our CBS onboard cameras. The third camera lies in the Kenny Bernstein car with Ricky Rudd, that Buick machine. All right, they're out of turn four. Pace car is coming in from Ricky Rudd's vantage point. This is what the start of the Daytona 500 looks like right in there behind Phil Bartdahl's car. 42 competitors, 42 cars straining now, coming down, 
at about 55, 60 miles an hour, and the green is unfurled. We're underway. A nice start. Coming up to speed for turn one. It'll be the back straightaway before they get them all the way wound up, and Schrader jumps out and fright. Maybe, El much. maybe Ellison is able to stay with him right on the outside. Of course, he's getting help from Darrell Waltrip back there. When you can get two cars running together, the draft is very effective. Right there in turn two is where Allison touched the wall yesterday. But here comes Allison's first high-speed corner. With this carburetor place, the cars really don't get up to speed until about three-quarters of a lap have gone by. Allison to the inside. Bobby Allison scooting down low on the racetrack by one, by two. Here's Allison going for first place to lead the first lap. The two-time champion out of turn number four. Allison pressing hard, and it will be at the line. The Allison's father and son leading the first lap of the Daytona 500. That's Allison looking right up under the headlights of Darrell Waltrip at 190 miles per hour from that camera out in the back end of the car. You know, they say this track is boulevard smooth, but look at the ripples and how sensitive these cars are to the bumps here at the Daytona International Speedway. That back straightaway, only 40 feet wide. Bobby Allison falls back. Davey Allison on the point momentarily. Here comes Waltrip. Remember that Waltrip won a qualifier, and here comes Rusty Wallace in the Pontiac, zipping around Davey Allison and going to the second place. From Wallace's perspective, this is what it looks like. Up in front, Rusty Wallace charging up through the cars and now finds himself running in second spot. Some people were saying they would not be able to pass because of the reduction in the horsepower. Well, we've already seen that theory go down the drain because there has been passing already. Last lap at 190.6 miles per hour. And that's faster than we anticipated. We wonder if any of these drivers have been holding back throughout all the weeks of practice and qualifying events. Well, certainly now the chips are down. The big money is on the line. If you have anything, it's time to show it. Checking in on Bill Elliott well back in the field as he tries to sort himself out. There's Michael Waldrop and his Pontiac on the outside. Dave Marcus, who could have a very good day today, and that number 71 as they come traipsing up through the field. Back with the leaders. Darrell Waldrop is on the point with his Chevrolet. Pontiac is in second. Rusty Wallace. It's Bobby Allison in third. Davey Allison in fourth. Let's check in on Richard Petty's car number 43 here as he comes up through from 34th position from whence he started. Petty had some high-powered company back there behind 30th position. Bill Elliott started in 31st, and Cale Yarbrough, a two-time winner of this race, started in 32nd position because of problems they had in Thursday's qualifying round. And the fans, these drivers, and their legion are watching them hoping they'll come to the front. And Richard Petty did not get off to a very good start. As a matter of fact, his group, he's in a group of four cars right there that sort of lost the lead, draft. 42 automobiles back to the line, and as they come to the strike, Blake Speed is pulling a bit of a surprise. He's up into fourth. They come back across. Look at those cars, three and four wide behind the front automobiles. Davy Allison trailing that front twin ten. Look. Massive equipment rolling into turn number one at 190 miles an hour. They can while those cars race for six back through about 30th position. There are five cars that have been able to pull away a little bit. When two cars run side by side, the others run single file. It gives them an advantage. You know, the drivers, even though it's 190 miles an hour, they consider it slow. Three abreast, it really, you don't see that this often. Uh, there's a, some frustrations that have been evidenced by the drivers here. They just can't seem to get the speed out of the cars they're used to when they want due to the restricted engine. As they come back to the line, Walter, Wallace is in second, Allison in third, Lake Speed in fourth, David Allison in fifth, Greg Sachs is in sixth, Bobby Hillen maintains the seventh position. Dale Earnhardt still sorting himself out, getting up to the field. Dale is going to be very careful for a while, as are a lot of the drivers, because they know it is a long race, as Bill Elliott said. You can't take chances this early in the race. You want to sort of sort the competition out, sort your own car out, see how it's handling in the air uh, from the draft of other cars. So the smart ones will do that. It's one and seven ten seconds between fifth car and sixth car on the field from Ricky Rudd, who is following Rick Wilson out here in this field, down in the turn. Now, Wilson is running on Hoosier tires today, Chris. Nine of those cars out there have been running. And not only that, Wilson is in his backup car. He crashed uh, last week. 
and he injured his knee. He's got a swollen left knee. He's not comfortable at all, but he's been going like a bomb since he moved into this backup car. He crashed in turn number two right from the bottom of the track, right into the wall at 190 miles per hour. Very lucky he didn't get broken up. He did wipe out that car. It is the backup car you see him in. And here's Walter. Remember that Walter led all the way in the 125-mile qualifier, and that's some feat. The last time it was done, 1960, when both Carter Mar Roberts and Jack Smith led from green to checkers. And Ken, one way that he was able to lead 125 miles was kicking his car right down on the bottom of the racetrack, and we can see that that car is still working in the same manner today. Schrader leading that second pack of automobiles. Driving a very deliberate race, he's willing to back it up a little. Greg Sachs is running side by side with him there in the number 50. Pontiac and Chevrolet wheel to wheel. The second group of machines. Lake Speed being challenged. The third of the car on the outside, a little high, and Bobby Allison down low. Allison put on a master performance in the Thursday 125 mile qualifier. That's the new GM 10 body and probably the best one working here. Those Chevrolet Monte Carlos have had a lot of experience in this drive. Rusty Wallace appears to be right where he wants to be, just lying in wait in second place here in the early lap. Seven are complete of the 200 to be run. I think that Wallace wants to hook up with Waltrip and pull away from the balance of the field. Two cars together should be able to do this. Coming by to complete eight laps this time with Darrell Waltrip in command of the great American race live on CBS. We'll be back with more shortly. Darrell Waltrip has just been relegated from first to fifth as the draft overwhelmed him. And it was at that point Rusty Wallace and Allison that led it through. And now Allison is broken away. And you can see the number 27 falling back. Now here's the second flock of automobiles. And in that group lies the B1 bomber, as he calls it, the stealth machine, number three of Dale Earnhardt, pulling up into sixth position as he sorted himself out in the early going. Earnhardt definitely on the charge. He finished second in his 125-mile qualifier and said, we ran second. That's no good. That's right, and he's a good bit behind. You know, the drivers complained earlier this week about having to keep their foot on the gas all the way around, lap after lap, and Earnhardt said he had a cramp in his leg after he won the crash last Sunday, which is only 20 laps long. I wonder if that'll be a problem in the race today. It could be. There's one car that was running up in the front pack that's in trouble. Morgan Shepard is on pit road. He coasted into the pit. Something wrong with his pit. That's a car that didn't get much, much testing back in December and January. It looks like it's going to be the first retiree out of the race. And that is a second car also coming out at this point. Car number 86 is falling on the wayside, which would be Rick Jeffrey, the prospect Kentucky runner. Now there's Shepard's car back by the filling station. Long laps 13 complete this time by Allison Bobby out in front. Allison Davy in second, Lake Speed in third, Walter in fourth, Rusty Wallace in fifth, Schrader is back to six, and Earnhardt falls to seven. Here's Mike Joy on pit road. I'm with the crew chief of the Rusty Wallace number 27 car, Barry Dodson. Barry, this looked like a checkers game. Rusty sat behind Daryl, waited until Bobby came up and said, King me, and off they went. Now he's back to the back of the pack again. You need a partner out there, don't you? Yeah, you got to have a partner, probably two. You know, the, the Kodiak Mobile One Pontiac's running good. I'm just sitting here giving lap times. Harold Elliott, the guys in the motor room, they did their job. Jimmy Makefar's got the chassis working. Uh, Bobby Allison's real strong. We're just going to try to find us a buddy and hang on. So they're trying their moves now to see what may work later in the race. Ken, I think we'll see a lot of that jumping around in the early laps. I don't think I can remember a 500, gentlemen, where one driver, Bobby Ellis, has been so heavily favored going into the competition. There's a scintillating drive in his 125-mile race, his long years of experience. He's starting his 25th 500 right now, and he's even money, said this morning newspapers, and the heavy favorite today. Well, my sense is it's among those lead cars, those, the car right there of Bobby Allison. Darrell Waltrip, Rusty Wallace to the side of all this afternoon, Ned. And Bill Elliott keeps picking his way up through the field. He's certainly not to be counted out of this thing because he does have the winning experience. Here. Look at Waltrip run right on the bottom of the racetrack through turn number four and back into the straightaway area here, that short straight, 1,600 feet before the 18-degree bank trioval, which is the most difficult turn on the track right here. Chris. That's an interesting observation. Most people would think of steep turns 
at either end of this track are the more difficult. But this 18 degree high speed, flat out, start finish line corner has traditionally been the toughest for any kind of racing car, be it a stock car or a sports car. The reason being the cars get light going through it and they don't want to handle properly. And some say the only place to pass with the reduced horsepower, the best place, is at this dangerous point to start finish line. The Allisons, father and son, run first and second. As to Davy Allison's car and its condition, as Waltrip makes a move on the inside and begins to pull by, will he get through here into turn four? He's up one. He and Wallace on the inside trying to overwhelm those leaders. And in that trial, he falls back a little. Let's see if we can find out just what the condition on Davy Allison's car is as we watch this battle continue up in front. David? Well, after a long night of work, this crew is now feeling some anxiety. Davey fell back to fifth, feeling out the car, has charged back to second. Robert Yates, what's he telling you on the radio? Well, the car's a little bit tight, but uh, we knocked the right side off of it and had to repair the whole right side. And uh, Carver was trying to get the clearance just right. We got the right front rubbing uh, a little bit, so first pit stop, we'll have to do a little work on the fender. Any danger that that rubbing fender might cut that tire before the pit stop? Well, if it's on the flat, uh, hopefully not. It's, you know, we think maybe it's over on the edge and, and won't be disturbing that. We'll just have to watch it real close. He's obviously driving it pretty hard. He's obviously driving it hard. Car's working pretty good. Yeah, I would say so. He's right back up where he started, but there is a rubbing fender on the right front tire, the damaged side of Baby Allison's car. Ken? After 14 laps, David, the standings look like this. As we watch Davey Allison press on the inside and pull up beside his father, Allison against Allison, father against son, and the son goes out in front, and here comes Waltrip back in again. Hold the phone, don't want to go anywhere. This is just too good to miss. Here's Darrell Waltrip down on the inside, challenging. He's coming up. He's going for the lead. Remarkable, Chris. It's amazing that Waltrip's car works so well down low on the track and has the pull to come out of the corners. And I think as the day goes on, that will be more to his advantage as the track gets a little bit slicker. If you can keep the car down low on the racetrack, it'll definitely be to your advantage. You see that car on the 18 degree bank lean to the right, and even before you get out of the corner, it switches back as the wind gets a little there. Certainly the wind moves the cars around when you're running these speeds and running that close to other cars. Well, here's Davey Allison, the youngster, coming up. He's going after Waltrip. Let's go back to Mike Joy for a moment. I'm with Jeff Hammond, Darrell's crew chief. Darrell lost the lead for a minute there, but he wasn't playing around with him. No, Mike, uh, what happened was uh, Darrell hauled on the radio and said, I believe I hit some oil in one or two. The car got real loose on him all of a sudden. So uh, uh, he just, you know, kind of slid back there in the back there a little bit. And uh, so now he's working his way back up the front. Car seemed like it's working real well. So, uh, you know, we're just going to try to hang on and uh, lead as much as we can and try to stay out of trouble. It looks just like Thursday with that car glued right to the bottom of the racetrack the short way around. Cars work exceptionally well all, all week, Mike, and uh, you know, I can't say enough about the, the time machine and all the guys that's worked on it. Darrell's just done a super job. I think it's probably the best Daytona I've ever had, and I think Darrell would say the same thing. His mental attitude and everybody's mental attitude just been a big uplift for us, so uh, you know, we really enjoyed this uh, Daytona trip, no matter what the outcome of this 500-mile uh, might be. Well, the last man to run all the race on the bottom of the racetrack was Bill Elliott in 1985, and he won going away. Steve Moore just getting lapped, and there's a smoker in the back straightaway. That's the Roush car, that new Ford, number six. Martin Martin out of Arkansas, the driver for Jack Roush, and the engine is expiring in the early going. That could bring out the first caution of the day. Yellow is on the track. It comes out as we reach the 20th lap. At lap 20, first caution of the day. The speed at the end of the first 10 laps was 189. And that compares to a 199 by Bill Elliott back in 1985. 189.076, the record 199 is Elliott's record of 85. And with that restrictor plate, that shows you that they brought him down 10 miles per hour. Exactly. You know, this pit, this yellow flag is a great break for Davey Allison to get that right front tire change, whatever's wrong. The Goodyear people tell me that at speed here, these 3,500-pound cars with the downforce created by the air, the right front of the corner weighs 8,700 pounds in the turn. That's a lot of weight. We'll be back with more in a moment. There's the scene of the two and a half mile Daytona International Speedway with a gigantic crowd here today to enjoy this 30th annual 500. Here under caution, first one of the day after car number six. 
driven by Mark Martin had an engine expire. One of the stories of the weekend was the story, sadly, of J.D. McDuffie, an independent who's been racing for a quarter of a century. His best finish was in this very race. That finish was only a seventh. He's run some 631 events and never tasted victory, sat on the pole once. Earlier, we talked to J.D. McDuffie at the hospital today about his injuries. Well, I'm feeling pretty good. I still got that much pain in my hand, and my hands uh, got second and third degree burns on in my leg. But uh, I'm gonna be all right here in a week or two. But uh, it's 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 burnt pretty bad. My hands are, but I was lucky to get out of it. The love of the sport, you know. That's that's all I've ever done is race, and uh, that's all I know. And uh, I I still love to do it, uh, and I'll be back. This thing ain't gonna get me down. Not gonna get him down, but it's got him in the hospital with burns over 15% of his body. They actually found the steering wheel burned and it's melted in the car. And that all happened just on Thursday in the qualifying race, a tough break for JD. Taking a look at the leaderboard now with 22 complete. Darrell Waltrip had the lead at 20 of 200 laps complete. Lake Speed at that point was maintaining the second running position on the field. The Mississippi driver pulled up. Davey Allison was running in third, Bobby Allison fourth, and Rusty Wallace was rounding out the top five. People may wonder why the yellow flag is out after a car blows an engine. The problem is the oil that it spills on the track it makes it very slippery and very dangerous. And the service vehicles have to go out there with a dry chemical to put over these oil spots so the track is safe again for racing. Why our yellow is on right now. They've made some uh, changes on Darrell Waltrip's car. Let's find out about them. Adjustment on the back of Darrell's car when he came in. Gary, just what did you do with this tool? Okay, well, what we're doing, we were just a little bit loose and uh, we stick it on the spoiler blade and uh, we tweak it up just a little bit to get us a little more angle on the spoiler blade to tighten the car up just a little bit. It really helps. How precise an adjustment is that to change the angle? Is it one or two degrees, or is it just a good guess? Well, I, I give it about three and a half or four that time. It's it's pretty. You got to really do a lot, do it a lot to really know exactly what to do. Walter hopes that will give him a little more downforce with that spoiler standing up straighter and help glue the back end of that car down even better. If it does, that could be bad news for the rest of this field. But on the other side of the coin, when you put the spoiler up, you slow the car down. It's more stable and more comfortable, but not as fast. One lap and they're going to be back under green. Greg Sachs was just on quick road and backed out another time. It's number 50. In fact, practically everyone made a pit stop during this caution period. Ken, some only took on gasoline. There were some that changed tires and some that changed all four tires. There's the Greg Sachs car with that Valentine on the hood. <laughs> Keeping with the day. So, what about fuel, gentlemen? With the situation today with these one-inch restrictor plates, we saw several cars go the entire 125-mile distance on Thursday, plus two preliminary laps over 30 miles. That's a lot further than they've ever gone before. And that's right, but the Thursday races were both interrupted by long caution periods, which gives better fuel mileage. I would think it may be at 110 miles today. Now, this yellow flag here, we should go to 110 miles before we need gas. Sachs is back on pit road. Uh, that'll break his heart. Car number 50 being backed into the garage area. Greg Sachs, Dingman Brothers Pontiac, unsponsored this year. Comes out of Florida. Car number 50. His heart was just broken when he had to do that. And it was. Because he won here a couple of years ago in the Firecracker 400. And the last couple of years, his best finish has only been on, what, 10th? Greg Sachs out of New York. Let's see if we can get a word to Davey Allison here in the back straightaway. Davey, how is the car working right now? Ken Squire, CBS Control. Davey Allison, can you read us? And apparently shut down for the moment as we get set for the green flag to come back on the track. He's ready to go racing. Throws up his hand. I think he acknowledged it, but he's ready to go racing right behind Dale Jarrett in the car number one. Anybody you know? Yeah. <laughs> Jared Sun out there in car number one driving for Haas Ellington today. On the green, Rusty Wallace jumps out of the front. Lake Speed is in the second, Sterling Marlin is third.
and Neil Bonnet is in fourth and one car. Marcus is way off the pace, up against the wall, the blue automobile, slowing down dramatically. Back with the leaders as we're under green after the first caution of the day. And it is the Pontiac of Rusty Wallace going out in front. Holes reveal is in second with late speed. Sterling Marlin puts a Chevrolet in the third, then comes Neil Bonnet. That leg of his all full of pins and that terrible crash he had in Charlotte, North Carolina. Then fifth is Pilate, sixth for nine, seventh Wilson, eighth Walter, ninth Baker, and tenth Allison as they unlimber them here. And Lake Speed has moved out in front as Dave Marcus' life we car trails the pack. Lake Speed's car in the shuffle. Well, he's been a real surprise all week and getting left out of the draft at the bottom of the racetrack is the orange car, number 17 of Walter, trying to make up ground all by his lonesome. See if he can find a place to dip in there. You remember that very dramatic second place that, that Mike Speed had here a few years ago? He always runs well here in this race car. Here's Bill Elliott at number nine. He's being taken by Phil Parsons. And here comes number three, Earnhardt, after him. He's going backwards at this point. You know, Elliott hasn't shown us anything all week long. His transmission broke before his qualifying race started. We couldn't see how he would stock up against the competition. And this is his first real exposure of the year. Slides back in behind Dale Earnhardt on the charge and just in front of Cale Yarbrough as they come out of turn number four. Showing his 14th. There you see that number four car of Wilson, which will be a real factor for the car. Lake Speed, second in 1985. For the moment, has the advantage as Dave Marcus is in. Looks like the driver went down. I would say they would be the transmission probably the leakage you just couldn't get the gears to shift on the restart. Oh nine on the outside of Darrell Waldron. Waldron trying to find a place to get back in from that low groove. Follow this charge. Boy, what a start. Seven different leaders. Look at Phil Parsons up on the outside of Bobby Allison in the 12. And there's the man in black, Dale Earnhardt, defending Winston Cup champion right there. That's tight racing. And uh, Bobby Austin could move up behind Darrell uh, Walsh to set up a trail so they can both run on the inside of the track. But Rick Wilson at number four alongside Darrell Walsh giving him a good ride up. Okay, we've had Bobby Allison, Darrell Walsh, Rusty Wallace, and now Lake Speed lead this race after Ken Schrader was in front when they took the green flag. It's been a highly competitive 500 so far. For the record, Dave Marcus has his car back out on the track. He lost at least a couple of laps. From Ricky Rudd's viewpoint, there's Alan Kowicki, the kid that sat on the pole three times last year. What a story. That uh, fellow Alan Kowicki in the number seven right behind Ricky Rudd. Courier leaders back in turn three, coming around to complete lap 28. And Mississippi's late speed, pulling a bit of a surprise, charging out in front here. For this gigantic draw. Sterling Marlin stays second. Rusty Wallace third. Neil Bonnet maintaining fourth. Lodine in fifth. 13 car draft up in the front. Very early in the going. There's Sterling Marlin. Billy Hagen, number 44. Coming after Lake Speed. Effort in 1988 on the Winston Cup Tour. For the first time since he formed his own team last year, he will run the full 29 race schedule. We're being told that Greg Sachs went back to the garage area. Oil pump failure being reported on car number 50. Here's Waltrip trying the bottom side again under Bodine. Buddy Baker right behind him in the 88. Here he is as he comes by. Let's see if he's able to do anything in the trial. Stay the 1986 winner, Bodine. Walter from 17, still seeking his first win in this most prestigious stock car race. Well, we'll be back with more live coverage of the Daytona 500 after this message and a word from your local station. Live from the World Center of Speed, the Daytona International Speedway, the 30th annual Daytona 500 here on CBS. We're working the 33rd lap, and at the present time, Sterling Marlin has put his car number 44 into the lead. Right on his rear bumper is Lake Speed. In third is Rusty Wallace. Fourth is Neil Bonnet. And fifth is Jeff Bodine. That's after 30 complete. Maintaining six is Darrell Waltrip, followed by Buddy Baker in seventh, Kerry Labonte in eighth, Rick Wilson in ninth, and Bill Parsons in tenth. Group stays in a tight, tight draft. 
11 automobiles now scoring off in that group. One car that has been a surprise is the Kenny Bernstein car, Ricky Rudd. He had he, in practice test sessions during the winter. He was among the fastest, but he's way back in the field, probably back about 20th or something like that. He just can't, in fact, he's in 24th position. That car, I don't know if he's having a problem or what, but he certainly ran much stronger than that in qualifying and in test sessions. I talked to Kenny Bernstein last night, and he was very optimistic. The car owner said he thought they had the problem sorted out and were going to have a great day, but that is not the case. Well, we mentioned earlier that David Hobbs would be all over this 300-acre facility today, and let's find out where he is right now. Well, Ken, there are some vantage points for this race, and then there are vantage points. I'm telling you, where I am now is absolutely outstanding. I'm on one of the Union 76 observation balls down here at the end of the back straight, just going into turn three. And with me is one of the spotters who inhabits this little golf, -like, uh, golf ball-like dome, and his name is Herb Bates. Herb, what's your main function here? What's your job to do out of this spotter's ball? The spotter's job is to spot things before it happens. You spot fire smoke. You spot things up here and you call it into the main tower before everything ever has a chance to happen. So you're looking for debris on the track and stuff falling off cars, broken windshields, that type debris, of thing. Debris, anything hanging out, anything right. happening, you spot it before it happens, like I say, and you call it in. You've been coming here now for seven years. Do you ever get a chance to just look at the race and enjoy it, or is it all work up here? Maybe one week out of the month. Well, I tell you what, Herb has got a vantage point par excellence, and I'm just going to stick around here for a few minutes. This is absolutely incredible down here. Ken, back to your side of the track, about a mile, mile and a half from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Interesting spotter, spotter over there too, Chris. I don't believe you. Know, we've got seven rookies in the race. They're really not doing very well. Ed Pym in car number 98 started 40th in the Sunoco Buick. He's up to 18th place, and the other six rookies are behind him. This is a big day for the rookies. They all want to do well once the checkered flag waves. Like we Rick Wilson on pit road. He, Rick yeah. Wilson is coming down pit road a little out of control as he tries to find his pits. The car wigwagging momentarily. Probably a flat tire came the way it looked as the car came down. Indeed, they are changing the right side tires on his mobile. Ned, new body styles are running first, second, third, and fourth. Those smaller cars out in front right now. Give us a thought about that. Well, it might be surprising to some people that they are, Ken, but they've done a lot of work on those cars in test sessions and in wind tunnel tests this winter. Now, here on Thursday, some of them, of course, were having some problems with them, but they've had a couple of days to work with them since then, and I think they've learned a lot about them, Chris. Now, the interesting thing about those cars is that they're all different. They may look alike, but the Buick, the Pontiac, and the Oldsmobile only share one body part, the windshield. Everything else is their own private, and each car has to be treated differently. Here comes Earnhardt up under Rusty Wallace, and he takes over in fourth place. You see Waltrip up there in third. He had just made the pass on Rusty Wallace, and Earnhardt is beginning to assert himself for the first time in the event with 37 laps complete. And from the Goodyear blimp, hovering some 1,000 feet above the Daytona International Speedway, you get these dramatic pictures as they head down behind Lake Lloyd. At the controls of the blimp, Captain Richard Daniels out of Burbank, California. It's the gyro cam on board to give you these amazing pictures. It's Mike Waltrip's car out there, a little further back in the field. He's leading a big pack of cars back there. It includes Richard Petty and Ricky Rudd. Several drivers in that pack. All out of the top 20. Here are your leaders. Car number 44, Marlon up in front, and Lake Speed stays right there in second. Hanging on. Doing a great job. Trying not to go a lap down just in front of him is car number four, Rick Wilson, and he's having no luck there. The freight train overhauls him. Now here's Davey Allison right in there with Bill Elliott in the nine. Those two Fords coming up through traffic. Seems as though Allison's Ford ran better before he had it worked on. Both Allison's cars seem to be before that period. Sometimes when you change tires, you the Stagger is a little bit different on them, or the tires grow a little bit more than the other, and certainly that can make a big difference. Kale Yarborough almost hit the wall. He, Kale Yarborough almost tapped the wall in turn two, and he's on pit road right now. Apparently, he cut a tire down, Ken. 
the reason the car was so wobbly was at the end of the pits. Tough break for Dale Yarborough. He had moved all the way up to, what, about the 11th position from 32nd. Dad, why, why would a car cut a tire? What would cut a tire in a race where there's not been an accident or anything? Well, it doesn't take very much, Chris. There's not a great deal of rubber on these tires, only about 5 30 seconds of rubber. Of course, there is no tread on these tires, and the least little thing that they can run over, it could be just a little piece of debris and metal that might fall off of another car, or even it could be a gravel that might have been kicked up. Rick Wilson also had tire problems. Let's go to Dave Despain, see if we can get more on that. We won't get a lot more, Ken, because the tire engineers have covered up that tire. We asked them, can we show the people of America, and they said... We've got a no. crash happening in turn four, David. Excuse me. One car looping out of control, spinning all the way around, and coming to is uh, Connie Saylor in the car that was originally to be driven by Joe Rutman. It looks like he caught a tire. I'm not sure. We'll have to look at the pictures, but it spins, and you can see the right rear is down, and, of course, he could have flat-spotted and more after he looped it up here in the fourth turn. Caution is out around the track. At exactly the 100 mile mark. Number four trying to get his lap back, lap back and he did it. Car number four scooted to the inside and Rick Wilson has just picked up a lap. He had gone down a lap and as Sterling Marlin backed off, Wilson took the dare, went down to the inside and puts himself back in the lead lap of this Daytona 500 under caution for the second time. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. And the summary looks like this. After 100 miles, we've had six different leaders in the event. The lead has officially changed nine times, unofficially a few more than that. Only at the start-finish line do they count those changes. And the average speed is some 167 miles per hour, not anywhere near a record. Two cautions for six laps, and we're still under caution now. Four cars have officially retired from the event. Those cars out of the race, Morgan Shepard was the first retiree. Then Mark Martin lost an engine that created a caution period. Greg Sachs has gone back behind the wall. And Connie Saylor has just created the second caution of the day. Uh, Ned, you were checking on Cale Yarbrough. A, a lot of concern among a lot of fans as to whether or not he'd gone a lap down. He had just made a green flag pit stop with a cut tire not long before the caution came out. But uh, we learned that he did get back out and did not lose a lap. Rick Wilson did get his lap back. And you're talking about those lap leaders, Ken, it's interesting that the pole setters, the front row, has not led a lap in either the 125 milers or this 500 mile race here today. You know, the competition, there's 29 cars on the lead lap right now. The lap is 45 that's being completed as we prepare for the assumption of the Daytona 500 with Darrell Waldrip up in front. In the second position is Schrader, the pole sitter. He'd like to get out and lead a lap here. Yes, he would. He's in position now to do it in second place. And Darrell Walter takes him down into turn one. Neil Bonnet riding third and Bobby Allison in fourth. The lap cars, the air cars on the bottom of the lead track. And single file on the outside are the cars in the lead lap. And as Chris told you, there's 29 of them up there. Now here from Davey Allison's vantage point, he pulls up from well out and back on Ricky Rudd's automobile as they scoot into the back straightaway. Look how steady his hands are on the wheel. No shaking back and forth. It's really a stable car. And from the rear bumper camera, get this view going down into turn number three and up onto the 31 degree banking. Mighty steep out there. Just waving bye bye to them. It's a blue world. Here they come back to the line. We've gone for 17 in that front position, and Davey Allison way toward the back of this group, running outside the top 25 right now. One of the hardest working people at this racetrack is the person that operates the scoreboard. The positions don't stay fixed very long. Bobby Allison and the Buick number 12 has moved to third place behind Waltrip and Schrader in their Chevrolets, and he's coming. Ken, to show you how important pit work is, the first and second place cars were first before this caution. Sterling Marlin and Lake Speed are now running 18th and 19th after well, their pit stop. As we've said all week, Ned, this race, as much as on the racetrack, will be decided by the crews today. Those that can get in and get out quickly are going to be the ones up in front because it's better than 200 feet. We've got a crash in turn four again. A car spinning, slithering, slamming into the wall. And it looks like Kelly, Kelly Arborough's car. Indeed, Kelly Arborough's machine has socked the wall, it spun a couple of times, then nailed it. And it's 
going to bring out the third caution of the day. Hale has had a very tough time here at Daytona this week. He, of course, uh, run, spun out in the 125-mile qualifying race, did some damage to the rear of his 88 Oldsmobile. They repaired it, got him back in there. Of course, he had the flat tire earlier, got back in the state in the lead lap, went back out and was near the pack, end of the pack, trouble now. Racing, I, racing back to the line. They have not come back and uh, taken that official caution flag as yet, and here they come to the strike. And at the line, it is Waltrip as Dave Marcus tried to make up a lap. That's right. You know, we talked earlier about the aerodynamic qualities of these new cars, these new downsized cars. They've been in the wind tunnel time and again to try and get them to work good out here on the racetrack, and it's been a problem for many of them. Kale Yarborough being administered to by his crew. Get a chance to take a look at it again in a moment. Right now, we're going to pause for these messages and then back to review this third caution of the day. Kale Yarborough out of it. Coming about to complete 50 laps, 125 miles in the Daytona 500, Kale Yarborough has brought out the third caution. This is what happened to car number 29, the four-time winner of this classic. The back end just goes out from under him, whether he has a tire going down, Ken, or the air calls the car to just loop around. And remember that same kind of thing happened to him the other day, uh, down here in turns one and two. You know, it's just the third time for you ever. A few years ago, he was the one who climbed up on the air and turned over for no apparent reason. He's really had difficult luck here at Daytona in recent seasons. Unfortunate for Kale, he's standing by with Dave Despain. Let's find out if it was the same situation as Thursday when the air came off the back of the car and sent you spinning. What happened this time? Well, I blew a rear tire this time. I guess uh, I must have run over something on the racetrack from that wreck that uh, just happened down there. Tur uh, tire blew coming off turn forward and just nothing to do about it. They're getting ready to make a movie of your life story. They're not going to start it with this episode, are they? Well, I certainly hope not. I hope they leave this week out. One more quick question. Uh, there's talk now about when you're actually going to hang it up. Does a week like you've had here at Daytona make you think, heck, I'm not going back down there anymore? Well, no, I've had them like this before, and we come back strong, and we'll be back strong again. Kale Yarborough, out of the race, blown tire. Kale Yarborough, that's unfortunate, the great champion out of this race. Let's take a look after 100 laps at how this field was running. These are the cars in the race. As you see the field amassing in the back straightaway behind the pace car. This is how the field was running after 100 miles. And we're fairly close to a start. The light is off on the pace car. On the outside, you see Bobby Allison out in front. Bobby Allison has now led in 14 Daytona 500s. Richard Petty has led the most. He's led 20. There's Marcus still trying to get that lap back, and Neil Bonnet is up to second spot. Harry Gant finds himself in third for the Hal Needham team. Well, they had a terrible year last year, and they're trying to get things turned around. Ken, the fans might wonder what happened to Darrell Walter and Kenny Schrader. Both of them made pit stops, and I think one thing that put the former leaders that we talked about that were back in 18th and 19th place, put them that far back was the fact that they changed all four tires while many of the others just changed two tires on that other pit stop. And Waltrip will be all the way in the back of the field when they take the screen away. Bill Elliott is finally getting close to the top 10. He's worked his way up from that 31st starting position he had to take when his car quit before the start of the qualifying race. And now we may be able to see whether he can race with the leader. Indeed, Elliott is in that fifth spot. Running at six on the restart will be Bodine, then Cox, uh, in seventh, Kyle Petty in eighth, Bobby Hillen in ninth as they get the race under green for the third time today. Allison he makes a jump on the start. He's out in front by 20 car lengths. And, you know, after the last round of pit stops, he went the other way. It's amazing how a half a turn on a wrench can do so much of the performance of one of these cars. And also the transmission that they have in the car has a great deal to do with the restart of the race. If they got a real high third gear and it which doesn't kill their RPMs when they drop it into fourth, most of them will start in second gear on these restarts, shift to third and then down to fourth. And so if they don't lose too many RPMs, you can get a good jump. As they come out of turn number four, come by to complete the 52nd of the 200 laps. Harry Gant comes in the second spot, dropping back to the third position. Neil Bonnet in there as they slice up against the wall, that car and among the traffic. Here's your leader, Bobby Allison, twice victorious in this race. 
as confident as he has ever been that he can win here today. Car is working well. He does a lot of work on the machine himself, and he really feels that he knows this car and it will bring him to victory. Look at Harry Gant in the Travis Carter machine in second spot. There are 30 cars on the track in front of Darrell Wall. <laughs> some hard racing to do for a while to get back up to the front of the field where Bobby Allison pulls by this record crowd leading still another lap enthusiastic day on Thursday 90,000 were here on Thursday 25 mile qualifier it's a regular work day no holiday no anything I defy you to find another qualifying event that draws that kind of a multitude here's Harry Gant in the 33 and there's Trevor Boyce a lap car hugging the back end of number 33 and staying in that draft. From Davey Allison's viewpoint, he has the uh, Rick Hendrick car right there in front of him, Ken Schrader. There's Phil Bachdahl down on the inside in the number 73. Davey Allison trying to get sorted out and get back into this thing. You can really see the bumps there as they take them coming off of turn four. Notice the new grandstand on the right. It isn't quite finished yet. Hopefully we'll be finished for this midsummer activities here at Daytona. New hospitality suites and about 8,000 new seats added Dave, to this great sports facility. Davy Allison back in about 20th position trying to make a move on the outside and Barkdahl goes down to the bottom. Look at this as Kyle Petty is overwhelmed inside and outside. Davy scoots up by. Boy, that's tight running. Kyle's car appeared to slow a little bit the last time as he went through the trial with several cars passed him there, whether he's having a problem or he just got out of the draft. Now there's Davy Allison's car picking up to about 18th position. Here's Ken Schrader. They're working on the inside of Brett Bodine. I think more was expected of Bodine uh, today than he's given us in this car. It's a new ride for him, but one of but for his Fords. Number Bodine and the Northerner coming from Chemung, New York. His brother Jeff preceded him down here and has made quite a name for himself in this kind of stock car racing. Here's Richard Petty tagging along with Daryl Waltrip as they try to get back into this thing, and I believe that's Benny Parsons on the tail end of that group. It is indeed, and Benny, the former winner of this race, the 1975 winner, has already gone a lap down. He could just never really get his Ford to go in this week, Chris. You think, Ned, that with these carburetor restrictor plates, these drivers haven't learned how to deal with it yet? Somebody would duck into the pits and make a change to make the car a little bit better and go back out and find out that he really can't make up the ground he lost because the engine is not giving him the power he needs. Certainly there were some that just simply were not able to get the handle on what it took, how much air you needed to get into the carburetor to make it work with the fuel mixture. And uh, Benny Parsons' team, Junior Don Lever, were one of them. They admitted it in the garage area. They said, hey, let's get away from here and we'll take this plate off so we can get back to the kind of racing that we know something about what it takes to make that engine run. That group with Waltrip and Petty is 26, 27, 28th on the field. Bobby Allison continuing to lead. A lot of people think that Bobby Allison is the man to beat because it's going to take a smart driver and a real strategist who knows how the car works to win this event today, Bobby. And one of the other things, well, I think that it certainly can't be any drawback to be very familiar with the car and uh, the mechanical makeup of the car. And, uh, you know, I do have a lot of experience. So I've uh, been here a lot of years and come here a lot of years to get a lot of experience. He sure has the experience. He's been here since 1961. You know, and in addition to his experience, I mean, he also knows how to handle the inspectors and to look around the rules. <laughs> and that does count for something. Harry Gant, a bit of a surprise, coming up into second. Well, Bobby Allison probably does know as much about a race car and what it takes to make it handle as any driver out there. And let's say hello to his sister, his oldest sister, Claire Sunman, who is in the hospital in Fort Myers, Florida, very ill. Bobby went down to see her earlier this week, and he wanted us to be sure to say hello to her, That and certainly she's happy to see him out front right now. Bobby Allison winning the 125-mile qualifier, then coming back and winning the Rex Group Grand National 300 yesterday. What a dramatic race that was. Now, here's Bill Elliott. And right directly behind him, the man in black, Dale Earnhardt, who will be a factor before this day is over for sure. You know, it's been interesting that he's not been a factor at all so far in that black number three. And a lot of the fans here waiting for Dale Earnhardt to come up through the pack and take the vanguard here. 
Let's check in with Mike Joy with Ernie Elliott about that number nine car. Elliott's the man right in front of Earnhardt, and Dan and Ernie Elliott run his pit. You've had to play a chess game to get your guy with the front. Playing for field position on pit stops. No tires the last time, and no stop on this caution flag. Well, basically, everybody's doing it. You know, nobody's taking on power, and all they're doing is stopping and getting gas. You know, with a restrictor plate, you just can't do anything. You just have to sit there and ride around. And uh, if somebody falls out of line, you have to take a chance. You know, my and say, well, you know, I'm going to fall out of line and go with him, or I'm going to sit here and take his spot. Uh, you know, there, there's nothing really we can do. You know, we just sit here and do what we have to do to get Bill in and out of the pits so quick as, and let him make the decisions out there as to what he's going to do. So like a good football coach, Ernie Elliott is playing for field position, and he's jumping his car to the front of the pack with really quick pit stops. And on the field, he's fifth overall in the race. There's one car in that flock of leaders. That's Trevor Boyce, the number 95, who's getting a heck of a ride. Trevor Boyce, looking third in your picture, is a lap, a lap down and maybe two. But he's been staying in there for the past 10 or 15 laps, and I would think it would make some of those folks a little nervous. Anybody want a snack today? <laughs> I'm sure they can sell a lot of that here today. I bet you they do. Here's Allison out in front by 12 car lengths now. And he seems, Chris, to be able to just pull away once in a while. Just well, so that, he gets a little more there. He's got that car to where it handles. Bobby Allison is one of the few drivers, uh, Bill Elliott and Darrell Waldrop and uh, Rusty Wallace, among the others, who walk around the garage here with a wrench in their hand. When something needs to be done on the car, he does it himself. He tickles the car to his own fancy. Other drivers have mechanics working on the cars, studying them up, and they never really are quite as suitable to the driver. It's almost like getting a custom-made suit. You gotta go back for a lot of fittings to get it right. Bobby Allison is forever getting his car fitted to his needs. Chris, you were talking about Dale Earnhardt a moment ago. We haven't seen much of him. Well, maybe he can't wait any longer. Maybe he's getting itchy because here he is now trying to move up into the third position. Tremendous battle continuing for third now. Here's Earnhardt trying to make the move. Rusty Wallace coming with him for third place. Earnhardt on the bottom. This is the highest he's run in the order thus far. From Rusty Wallace's race cam, looking back here as Phil Parsons goes right up against the wall. You can see the car bounce a little there. Terry Labonte down on the inside as Wallace tries to sort himself out. He is running six, and he is directly behind car number three. You can switch that around. You can see the car number three. Look at Phil Parsons making a great charge today. Wallace is directly behind Earnhardt, and here comes Parsons trying to make a move on the bottom of the track. Back side of the racetrack. And that's Terry Labonte down on the inside. He moved back in line there in the car number 11, the Junior Johnson car. We haven't heard a great deal of him today, but uh, he'll be there. Look at how calm Rusty Wallace looks. You know, it's a, a Sunday drive, which is what it is, but it's the Daytona 500, and he's sawing away at the wheel. Finding himself now another position. Earnhardt, and look at this struggle continuing as car number 27, Rusty Wallace, tries to fend off three competitors attempting to overtake him. Now let's see where David Hobbs has found himself these days. Well, while the racing is getting the attention of most people here at the track, another subject that Ken just brought up a few minutes ago, that is snacks. There's a lot of people's minds down here. These guys haven't come for snacks. They bought their own tree and their own axe. They got a full-blown bonfire down here on which they're going to cook all sorts of goodies as the afternoon progresses. And as you can see, the fans down here are having a whale of a time. This is not just a Daytona 500 race. This is a real event here in Florida. And these guys are going to be making jolly sure that they really enjoy it. Having a good time down here in the infield. Back to you, Ken, and this incredible race for the lead. I don't think he'd win a lumberjack contest. Here's Allison pulling away just a little more. It's that second place car number 33 apparently wants a bit of a draft now, and all he has is the car of Trevor Boyce. He needs a little bit more than that. Trevor's getting a grand ride out there and staying right up with the front people, although he's running better than 28th on the overall. There's Trevor Boyce from Canada having a great day. The only Canadian in the race. And we will return to Daytona for more live coverage of the Daytona 500 after this word from your local station.
Lake Speed's car has just been in an altercation that did not bring out a caution flag. Let's take a look at what happened to Lake first from the vantage point of Davy Allison's car up here in turns three and four. There's Allison. They're just coming out of three, and it's right in front of him here. Purple car. Ken, it looked like a couple of cars touched, and Lake Speed got into one of those and rumpled quickly, up the back of the car. Yes, it did. He quickly got it down to the inside of the racetrack out of the way of the traffic. Now, let's see if we can see it here. Here's Waltrip down on the inside. And there's Alan Kowicki. And it's already happened here. The car uh, has been nailed and uh, is slowing down. But he was collected on the right-hand side of the car. And that's put him at least a lap or two down and will cure any hope he has of winning this race. Speed is one of the very few owner drivers in the race. Most drivers here driving cars owned by other people. Lake Speed owns his own racing team, so it's doubly difficult. Well, he's still coasting team. around trying to get back to the garage area, so he's uh, losing more and more time. There was smoke coming from the car, Ken. I don't know. It could be that something happened to the engine that caused his back end to get loose, but you can see the damage that's done to the left rear quarter pan. Well, the bodywork is rubbing against the tire at speed, I think, man. Back to the garage, and let's take a look at positions 1 through 15 after 64 laps. Here's what they were running. Allison first, Gant second. Bill Parsons rounding out that top five. That was at 64 laps. In six, Bill Elliott. Back on the end of that pack uh, in 10th, Rusty Wallace, Mike Waltrip staying up in there. And then the uh, final five in our top 15. Lake Speed is just retired. Sterling Marlin, Bobby Hill and Alan Kowicki, Buddy Baker. And that would put into 15th now, Darrell Waltrip. You know, that Michael Waltrip car, that's an interesting story. His car was damaged severely in the qualifying round, and he, he missed the race. And his sponsor, Country Time Lemonade, went down the lineup and found one car that was willing to have its drivers step out and Michael Waltrip take his place. So financial arrangements were made. Jim Sauter of Nacida, Wisconsin, stepped out of the car, and it was repainted here on the grounds in the colors of its sponsor so that the guests of Country Time Lemonade would have something to root for when this race came off today. I understand Chuck Ryder, who owns the Waltrip car, somewhere between a thirty dollars and $50,000 deal to get Michael into this race. It's a lot of it. It was money. Between the time they paid off this other sponsor, or the car owner, made a payment to Sorter, painted the car, and let it in, 50000 is what it went to. What they paid for the paint job. I don't know, but it weighs 12 pounds. <laughs> Here's Dave Despain. Lake Speed's automobile has just come into the garage area. Lake, once again, you've gotten to the front at Daytona. Once again, you end the day over here. What happened? Well, I think the bottom end must have come out of the engine. It's what it's, it felt like it broke a rod or something internally broke in the engine. I'm not sure what, but it gave no warning whatsoever. It just snapped. You spun in your own oil. Anybody else get involved in it? No, we didn't spin. We kept her straight and stayed out of the way. We got tapped. One car tapped us in the back, when, of course, when we slowed in front of them. But uh, other than that, you know, everything was smooth. That accounts for the damage that you see on the right rear quarter panel of the car. This was the tap from the back after the rear end, the bottom end rather, of the motor apparently went away on Lake Speed. Let's go down pit road to Mike Joy. As Chris was talking about a minute ago, Jim Sauter is out of the 500. 22 cars and drivers went home because they didn't qualify. Here's the guy I feel sorry for because you raced your heart out and made the race and then got pulled out of the car, Jim Sauter. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, we feel pretty much the same way about it. But uh, in reality, uh, Mike Waltrip is competing for all the points, and uh, we decided that we'd let the country time folks and Mike Waltrip uh, take our car and give it their best shot, along with the Evan Rood, uh, Abu Garcia people, why we all made an agreement, and it was real hard to step out of the car, but I felt that maybe later on it would help me. Now, you could have left and gone home, but you're here to cheer him on. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't miss this for the world. I think he's doing a fine job out there. Well, they've mixed pit crews, and they are just about out of gas. This car will likely be in the pit lane in a minute or two. That's going to be a hard day for the father of 12 from up Wisconsin way. Now, here's Waltrip down on the inside of the racetrack and continuing to nip through and pick up positions. This is going to, as he is overwhelming, the field is going to put him up into eight as he goes under car number five. 
which is the 86 champion, Jeff Bodine. And Ken, Chris pointed out not long ago after the restart of this race that he had about 30 cars in front of him, so he has just methodically picked them off up through the field. He's probably the fastest car on the racetrack, even though Bobby Allison has checked out as far as uh, his lead over the second-place car, Dale Earnhardt. There's the interval between first number 12 and then number three, the black car, followed by number 75. And here's Waltrip closing on Phil Carson as he continues to zip through the field. Waltrip has said all week he has been as confident this time as ever that he can win. Bodine coming with him, Parsons dropping back too. And we'll get a lap speed just on Darrell Waltrip as he tries to move back into this thing. He's up to six. We have another car on pit road. It's Michael Waltrip, his brother, as predicted, is bringing the car number 89 into the pits, take on fuel. Here's Mike Joy. You see, it's a combination of crews here. In yellow, the Mike Waltrip crew. In red, white, and blue, Jim Sauter's team. Regardless of who's doing the work, it's got to be fast service to keep Mike Waltrip on the lead lap. Two tires. Now they're waiting for the gas. When the car drops off the jack, he'll take off. He's gone. Does not lose a lap. Well, not yet, but he has to get his speed up then. And Bobby Allison is coming off of the fourth turn now. And it takes a while to get the speed up. So Mike's going to have to really try to get those gears through those gears in a hurry not to go a lap down. That's the battle of the pit, as you see, for just a moment. That's led by number 27, Rusty Wallace. Right behind Wallace is Darrell Waldron. And lap speed on Darrell Waldron as he's been trucking through traffic. Just a few laps ago, Walter and Patty were together in the back of the pack after the pit stop. And now Walter is up to sixth place when Patty is fired back in the 24th position. There's Walter hanging on. He's got a good draft here. I wonder if he really wants to go by or if he'll just stay with Rusty Wallace and let the two of those people try to find their way up through. He, he needs to get by. In fact, they have. They have pulled up on the second, third, and fourth place card. They have pulled up on number three, Earnhardt, number 75 in third, Bonnet, and the fourth place card, number 33, Gann. Now that's the one speed in the last year, 190, 677. That really is the speed of that pack in overwhelming the cars of Earnhardt, Bonnet, and Harry Gann. We should get a, a speed on leader Bobby Allison now, the number 12 car, to see how they compare. He's out there all alone, punching a hole in the air without any assistance, and he has a lead of over 100 yards. Now look at this flock just behind. Bobby Allison's number 12. There you see them. And I believe that Walter is making a move to the inside and taking another spot right here. He pulls Rusty Wallace back another position, and he's up on Harry Gann. Wouldn't it be something if these two drivers... Bobby Allison and Darrell Waltrip, who had such superb afternoons in the 125-mile qualifiers, those minute dashes usually, and now here to sort it out before the afternoon is over. Both were exuding confidence all week. Here is Harry Gant running in fourth, being challenged by Darrell Waltrip. Both of them would like to get things turned around. Their seasons last year were not what they wanted them to be. And so they're both in the Chevrolet Monte Carlos, a body style that's been raced for a couple of years now and are comfortable with the drivers, whereas Allison is one of the new Buicks, one of the short cars, but he's really got that one figured out. Here's Allison still with a pretty good lead, but I think that interval is being chopped into now by the freight train that's overwhelming them. Here they come, back to complete 78 laps of 200. Well, his speed was six. not nearly as high as Darrell Walker was a moment ago. And that pack of cars, so they are. The Allison's day in the sun all by himself may be gone shortly. But I'm amazed he can stay out there as he is all by his lonesome with Earnhardt, Bonnet, all these people who are so good in the draft. And always two cars together have... Uh, cars together can run much faster than one car by itself. As the speeds have increased with the tires on these cars, they change the weight a little. There's just so much more technology now. Take a look at the uh, speeds as they've come up. 1973, 187. Went all the way up in 1986 to 209, then 87 to 212. Was dropped back down this year as a result of the carburetor restrictor plate. 
16 and a half miles an hour off the pole speed this year from last. Considerable reduction in horsepower there, what, 200? Here's Bill Elliott back there with Sterling Marlin in the field. We're well back. That first group completely. I'd say they're running in all 25th or worse at this point. Dale Earnhardt, the leader of uh, the second group behind uh, number one runner Bobby Allison, is closing the interval. Allison had over 100 yards on that pack. It's cut down to about 50 yards now as they're coming on. That interval shrinking at turn two. Bobby Allison, the two time winner there. Earnhardt, he's never won this thing. Man behind him, Neil Bonnet, he's looking for his first win. Gant, he too would like to see his name up on a Daytona 500. And of course, Darrell Walter, who's won what? 12 events here, has never won this 500. Darrell Waltrip has the one inch restrictor plate, made this race more of a driver's race than a horsepower game. Well, I feel like as a driver, now. I can do more than I could before. Now, instead of a guy just blasting by me with a burst of speed and a lot of horsepower, he's got to think his way around me. He's got to drive his way around me. So I might be able to do something as a driver with my car, move, change lanes, change lines, uh, go high, go low. A lot of things I might be able to do now to help me win a race where before is just brute power and a guy slow shot by you and you were history. Bobby Allison getting caught up here. Here's Earnhardt. Look at that car nuzzle down to the bottom of the racetrack and stay right there. And Allison's taking a very high line. Much higher than he was earlier. His tires are heating up a little bit, but he is definitely taking a higher line, and that's costing him some speed. Too. Meanwhile, Darrell Waltrip is closing on the inside. Here's Waltrip down to the bottom of Neil Bonnet, and he's ready to go for third. here from Europe, Adriano Cimarosti from Switzerland, and they can't get over the competition, the, the intensity of it compared with Formula One racing. Dead heat for third position into the back straightaway, as continuing to lead is Allison, but not by much over Der Dale Earnhardt. Two hundred five miles complete and here are the standings at 82 laps with Bobby Allison out in front, Earnhardt in second, Waltrip in third, Neil Bonnet in fourth, Harry Gant in fifth. Looking a little further back in the field, we saw that in sixth place at that time was Rusty Wallace. In seventh was Jeff Bodine. Terry Labonte in eighth. Let me correct something here. Bill Elliott has really moved up. He is in tonight, and he was only back in 11th, not in 25th earlier. Sterling Marlin in 10th, and in positions 10 through 15, perhaps. And green flag pit stops are coming up. Bobby Allison and Dale Earnhardt have come down pit road. Let's go to Dave Despain because the action is on pit road. Leader Bobby Allison into the pits, the team putting the gas in, and a minor adjustment on the rear spoiler, that rear wing, which controls the aerodynamic flow across the back of the car and holds it onto the racetrack. Allison was calling on the radio as the field were reeling him in, saying, guys, I got to have more wing. They're all over me out here. I got to get the car to grip. Crew chief Jimmy Fennick consulting with the crew. Jimmy, was he calling for the uh, for the adjustment on that wing and why? Yeah, he was just uh, a little bit loose, so we put a couple degrees uh, rear spoiler in there. Is that a big or a little adjustment? Yeah, right now it's just a little one. Otherwise, how is the guy that everybody's calling the favorite here? You look strong, or are you going to win this thing from here? Well, it's got a long ways to go, and right now we're sitting pretty good, but like I say, a long ways to go. Jimmy Fennick, crew chief for Bobby Allison, and we anticipate that Dale Earnhardt will be bringing his Chevrolet down pit road momentarily. And Dave, he did just bring his Chevrolet down pit road when Bobby Allison came in, and he beat Bobby Allison out of the pits by about two seconds. Meanwhile, the leader with 87 laps complete is number 17. Darrell Waltrip has gone out in front. Here's Wallace on pit road and scooting back out again. In the second spot is the number 75. That's Neil Bonnet. And up to third is Jeff Bodine in the five. He's right there. That's the interval between second and third. The fourth place man, Harry Gann, and now Bodine is pitting. So this will mean Waltrip stays first, Bonnet stays second, and the third place car, I believe, is number 11 at this time. That would put Terry Labonte in the third. We're going to see who the mileage masters are now. We're wondering about how many miles you can get out of a tank full of fuel under green flag running. We're finding out now. Here's Bill Elliott in. Green flag pit stop. Rick Wilson pitting. Harry Gant is on pit road. 
88 laps have been completed. Car number nine. And car number five breaks just a hair in front of him as they come out. Bodine out a tickle quicker. Rick Wilson is in for some time on car number four. Meanwhile, those two leaders complete another lap and show no signs of wanting any service from the pits. 17 the leader. Darrell Waltrip, Neil Bonnet of the 75. Now here's Terry Labonte again. That's been in third. And this will scramble the field momentarily. Terry Labonte in. Here's Mike Joy. Kyle Petty brings the Wood Brothers car to pit road. In this 30th anniversary Daytona 500, it's still a treat to watch the Wood Brothers go to work. They've been here a long, long time, and Leonard changes the right front tire as he's done for many years and still has the agility to hop across in front of that race car. The older brother, Glenwood, a winning NASCAR driver in the 40s, and he still calls the shots for that team here on pit road. And Mike, that car has not been running up the par for the last 30 or so laps. He had gone a lap down to the leaders. It sounds like he was only running maybe on about seven cylinders. You might check on that with the Wood Brothers while you're there. These, these are the pressure stops for the pit man. The yellow flag is out. You can feel a little bit loose or perhaps sloppy because a couple of seconds doesn't make any difference. But the green flag is out here, and one or two seconds means hundreds of yards on the racetrack. Darrell Waltrip leading, Neil Bonnet is second, Sterling Marlin third, Davey Allison fourth, Buddy Baker in fifth, in sixth, Ken Schrader, and then seventh is A.J. Foyt, who is now just pitting. Then eighth is Alan Kowicki, and uh, Ricky Rudd is on pit road. Rudd has stayed in that lead lap, but has been not able to get up in that front pack throughout the day. Now remember, Darrell Waltrip made a pit stop during the last caution. He and Kenny Schrader were the only two. They were running first and second. They made a pit stop, so they have a little more fuel. Plus the fact that both of those drivers went a full 125 miles here on Thursday on a tank of fuel. Pit road as Ricky Rudd leaves that area. A.J. Fort right behind him. Back into action. 25 cars on the lead lap, which is a remarkably tight race as we come up on the 200 mile mark. But as you said, Chris, this stop under green will separate some of those people because some drivers get in and get out faster. And those pit crews, they can cost you dearly if they're not really ready. And Dale Earnhardt won that battle, hands down, by a better than a second, second and a half uh, over almost anyone else that pitted. That, show, that uh, Kirk Schelp and I let go is superb. The speed of the race at this point, 162.7 miles an hour. That's uh, 16 miles an hour off the record set by Bill Elliott back in 1985. 100, uh, 178, that mark. Here's the number 44, which had been wanting in third, Sterling Marlin pitting. And the second place car is on pit road directly in front of him. There is Neil Bonnets, number 75. You got to think that he's driving in pain out here, Ned. That leg was not broken. It was shattered right at the hip in that crash he had last year, but he'll never admit to it. 15 and 8 tenths seconds, he's underway. Good pit stop for him as he changed tires and fill it up with gasoline. Well, Ken, I'm not sure that he would have pain right now in the race car. Once that green flag drops, all of that sort of leaves you, even if you had pain before the race did start. It's amazing the physiological things that happen to a race driver. Wilbur Shaw in Indianapolis many years ago gashed his hand the day before the race, had a deep cut to the stuff. He drove the 500 mile races and he won. And when the race was over, the cut was healed. The Same thing happened in that Same identical thing, right, Ned, years ago? Yes, in my early sportsman days back in the, the late 50s. Healed within about 36 hours from the time they sewed it up. Amazing. Number 17, Waltrip continues to make the Daytona 500 an economy run. We'll see how much longer he can last shortly. Out of mind. gas. Two cans of gasoline and right side tires for Waltrip. He's away and back in the race. He's running. Waltrip has now had 10 tires on that race car and one pit down. Neil Bonnet, who started the race on Hoosiers, has yet to change a single tire. They put two cans of gas in Bonnet's car. It takes longer to do that than it does to change the tires, but Bonnet says the car's handling beautiful. And looking at the tires, the wear is negligible. So he's still out there on the original four set of skins. Waltrip went 25 miles longer between pit stops than did Bobby and Dale. Let's take a look at the uh, Quaker State race summary in this event. There have been six leaders. Lead changes have been 11 after a wild start. It settled down again. The record is 70 back in 1974. Uh, 
cautions three for a total of 10 laps the average speed at 162 miles an hour and here are the folks that are out of the race Morgan Shepard was first out then Mark Martin brought out a caution flag Greg Sachs has retired Connie Saylor had trouble up in turn number four Cale Yarborough socking the wall after he cut a tire Lake Speed lost an engine going down the back straight away and up into turn number three those are the retirees in the event. Here's the man that one of the men that stands out at this point in the race. Bobby Allison in the number 12 reported in second position. Darrell Walker did maintain the lead after his pit stop, uh, Ken, and he's got a pretty good lead now over Bobby Allison. Looks to be about four or five seconds on the racetrack. He's getting 25 more miles out of a tank ball than anyone else. He's going to win this race on pit stop on, on fuel economy. That That's a mean, remarkable advantage. It really is. It could mean that he can make one less pit stop than the others. I don't. I don't think that's accurate. I, I believe that the, the scoring has, has switched that around. Well, one thing, as we pointed out earlier, he did stop during that last caution, and some of the others did not. So he had several laps right there. Yeah, that that advantage. advantage. Give him that lead by four seconds, then, and put Bobby Allison in second with Dale Earnhardt in third fourth place now belonging to the number 75 of Neil Bonnet and Rusty Wallace is back there in fifth. Boy that's incredible he's getting that kind of range. It really is and he's running hard and you get that kind of mileage you sort of have to take it easy. Let's see what the interval between Peter Dow Walton and challenger Bobby Allison is at this point and whether one is pulling away or the other is gaining. Darrell Waltrip and Davey Allison both pitted on lap 96. Davey stretched out the range in that car too, and I think they both had been in earlier at the same time in that caution period. That is true. Dale Earnhardt is right behind within three car lengths of Allison. And they need to get in the draft if they want to find. There's the number 12. And right behind him on the bottom side of the racetrack. And notice where Allison is still staying high all the time, Chris. And Earnhardt was making that Richard Childress car work right on the bottom. Last time by Alice was 4 and 43 100 seconds behind Waltrip. To see whether that high groove and those high reps that his engine is running at is getting the job done and closing the gap. Number 75 is the fourth place car. On pit road, they're watching those laps. See if there's any advantage. Coming to halfway. Coming to halfway this time by. And as they come to the strike, Earnhardt and number 75 Bonnet trailing behind Bobby Allison in the second position. He's about five laps down to that leader, or five seconds down to that leader. Number 17, Darrell Waltrip. The watch says that Allison is losing a tenth of a second a lap to Waltrip right now. Looked like he might have backed up to car number three and 75 as well. Here's Waltrip. Very lonesome cowboy out here at this time. He likes that. You remember on Thursday after the interview in Victory Lane, Dave Despain asked him about running in front all the way in the 125 mile race. And he said, what, What's that going to do? Are you going to be able to run in traffic? Are you going to be able to race with anybody? He said, I don't intend to race with anybody. And by God, he's not having to right now. There's second, third, fourth, and fifth. Wallace back in fifth. Then the sixth position, Bodine. Seventh is Gant. Eighth is Terry Labonte. There you see Bill Elliott back in the 11th position. Let's go to Mike Joy. Last tank of gasoline, Darrell Waltrip ran 47 laps. That's 117 miles. And Jeff Hammond, that's a couple of laps less than you had to run Thursday to win that qualifying race. How much farther could you have gone if you'd had to? Well, Mike, right now it's kind of one of those situations I don't really know. And I just decided at this point in time to race. We had a lot of racing left to go, and I didn't want to take a chance to get way behind. We've been working real hard. Darrell's been driving a real fine race to get us back up to the lead. And we wanted to make sure we kept it there, so we're just playing a little bit conservative right now. We've got a little bit of advantage over the rest of the competitors by a few laps, so we'll just try to build on that. And we know they can go 125 miles. They did it Thursday. How much farther than that remains to be seen. Harry Gannon, seventh. Terry Labonte, eighth. Phil Parsons in ninth. Sterling Marlin, tenth. Elliott is in 11th. And running in 12th is Ken Schrader with 13th Buddy Baker. And 14th, Davey Allison with 15th, Richard Petty. Maybe we can find out what kind of fuel mileage Bobby Allison got last time around with the number 12 Buick. We compare these things. The Thursday races were interrupted by caution flag. They really are not a good yardstick of fuel mileage because they cruised around for many laps, not burning too much fuel. 117 miles is excellent fuel mileage here at Daytona. As compared to last year. Exactly, 100 miles.
miles was considered good then. 163 mile an hour average at halfway, 250 miles. And that compares to the record of 179 by Bill Elliott's Ford in 1985. The restrictor doing its job here. And we still have 23 cars at halfway in the lead lap, Chris. That's remarkable. You know, when you look at the cars, you never know they're not going 205 miles an hour. No, you sure can. It, it makes the competition that, that much better, and it takes the edge off some of the risk. So no, not all of it. Right, and it's a safer race as well. Here's the field with 17, Waltrip trying to commandeer his first Daytona 500. He has struggled year after year. He had a terrible crash here a few years back. He hopes to turn it all around this afternoon with our live CBS coverage following him. Bad trouble, bad trouble. Okay, a terrible crash. Richard Petty's car has turned over seven or eight times coming off turn four and was just struck by another car. It's one of the most violent accidents we've ever seen at the Daytona International Speedway here as leader Darrell Waltrip squeezes through. Petty's car nosed into the wall and then went sideways and barrel end over end and then side over side time after time. A terrible accident involving the man who has won this race seven times over the years. Alan Kowicki in car number seven was was involved his car is limping towards the pits and there is the damage number 43 stp pontiac of richard petty out there on the track it was really a, a happened at one of the highest speed sections on the track and we trust that petty is okay in the car phil barkdahl was involved in number 73 and we're trying to identify which other car. There's number 23, Eddie Bierschwal, Jeff Bodine in car number 15, and of course, Richard Petty, the man who has won 200 races in NASCAR events. 50-year-old grandfather from Randleman, North Carolina, is still in the car as a safety man, and the ambulance crews are out there now trying to take minister to his needs. It was one of the worst accidents we've seen here in quite a while, Chris. As you can see, the damage to the back of the car. Now the safety people are there as the other cars weave their way through. This is Trevor Boys in car number 20. Eddie Beerswell. Yeah, Eddie Beerswell in car number 23. He hit the, the wall very hard with the back of his car. And it looks as though Beerswell... Uh is, uh, is okay. They don't seem to be concerned themselves too much. Parts of Petty's Pontiac are all over the racetrack. It's going to take a long, long time to clean up this damage as they're running the cars through the pits now. The uh, because of the debris, right, debris of all on the, the race, so the racetrack has moved down to pit road now from the track itself due to the debris that has come off of Petty's cars that crashed over and over and over after hitting the outside wall at high speed. Most of the drivers are, as they're coming down pit road, making pit stops as they normally do on caution flags. 107 laps complete. Let's take a look in replay at what has happened out of turn four. Richard Petty was running in a pack of cars and he starts the back end starts to go around and it looks he like tagged. it might have been tagged by, by the wrong. car number 73 of Phil Barkdahl and you can see Petty's car just framming and turning over up against the wall and other cars coming in. There's Barkdahl hitting him as he came by and the Eddie Beerswall car hitting one of the tires that came off the car. From another angle. That looks like the crash at Darlington years ago, Ned. Fortunately, it was staying on the nose of the car for so long, Ken, so it was not, didn't look like it was really taking hard bounces down onto the pavement. And it dispels some of the energy. You must remind the viewers that these cars are built to take these kind of crashes. And there's Phil Barkdahl hitting the cement wall right in front of us. The chrome molly frames that serve as a roll cage up under the roof to keep the car from crushing down on the driver. Let's take a look from uh, Ricky Rudd's vantage point. You can see the trouble start in, in front of him there. Whether the 73 car hit number 43, the 73 being driven by Phil Barkdahl, or 
Alan Kowick, he was in the middle of it too in the car number seven. He landed uh, down on the grass on the inside and he's with Mike Joy. And this is Alan Kowicki, Xerox Ford. What happened out there? There was an accident in a trioval before we got there and uh, I knew there was an accident. We were slowing down and you know, I thought it was clear I was through there. I went in between a couple of cars and there was debris all over the place. I ran over something, blew the right front tire out and the car swerved and ended up going into the wall. Who and what did you hit besides the wall? There's tire marks and paint all over. There's tire marks and paint all over that thing. Did you get into anybody else? I don't think I hit anything except the wall. You know, I was clear I was going to make it through. We ran over some debris and blew the right front tire off. But you're OK. Fine. Well, there you see the remains of car number 43, Richard Petty's brand new car being taken in the ambulance. We'll try to give you an update on his condition just as soon as possible. Here's where it began. Richard Petty, who first came here in 1959, and this, I believe, is the most serious crash he's ever had in this race. Pierre Schwal's pushing in there. Yeah. Or Barkdahl. That's Barkdahl's car Bark going uh, car. backwards there to car number 73. And Petty's car remains up against the wall, and you can see both tires fly off the car, and the other cars coming in now hitting the... That's what worries me, is that second crash. Bridge. That was Brett Bodine with no place to go and, and Brett making a solid hit on car number 43 spinning. Petty's car very high up in the air. However, the front was uh, still almost on the pavement and you see both tires, front tires, fly off the car there almost simultaneously. Ray J. Ford and uh, Rick Wilson came by, uh, made it through safely while the car was turning over. So even though, as, as you pointed out a few moments ago, Chris, they uh, reduced the speed, that does not make them that much safer. Now the car was way up in the air as well. It was surprising that it climbed that high in the air. See Kyle Petty coming down pit road. Dale Jarrett was right behind in that group of cars we see back there. Dale made a left turn down pit road and was able to avoid the trouble. Naturally, I had my eye on him. Notice the spectators moving away there, the officer going back from the fence. And that's another reason that spectators, wherever they're at, if they're watching today and planning on going to a race, don't ever get down close to the fence on the racetrack. Stay as far away back as you can. There's Eddie Beerswell's car, and there are the remains of car number 43, Richard Petty. Car crew chief, Dale Inman. We'll try to give you an update on Richard Petty just as soon as possible. 108 laps complete. Let's go immediately to the pits in Dave Despain. And it's a wild scene here outside the infield hospital where Richard Petty has just been taken. A.J. Foyt was one of the drivers involved in the accident. It has a lot of close feelings for Richard Petty. You've been in to check on the man, A.J. What's the story? Well, I think everything's looking good. I just walked in to get okayed by the hospital. I was the one that, when Petty come down across track, I was probably one of the first to hit him on the left front. You know, it just... I don't know, the back end jumped out from under him, looked like, you know, so it's just one of the misfortune things. I think he's going to be all right, and thank God for that. It all started. Well, I was going into that whole group on the bottom side, and it looked like uh, one of the cars behind him or something jerked the back end out from under him. The car jumped sideways, and when it jumped sideways, he come down across the track, and when he did, I hit him real hard on the left front. We've got a wrecker wheeling through here, and we're going to move over out of the way. AJ, did you see Richard inside the hospital? Yes, uh, what I saw him, he looked like he was uh, conscious and everything else, so thank God for that. Thank you, A.J. We have one more angle to look at on that, one more word from down here. Dale Inman, the crew chief on Richard Petty's car, and, of course, Richard's cousin came by here a few moments ago, and this was the signal. It appears that Richard Petty is okay. Let's go back upstairs. As his pit crew packs up, gets ready to go back to Level Cross, North Carolina, there you see his cousin, Dale Inman, on the right side of your picture. Here is another angle that we haven't observed of this very serious crash. As they come off for the fourth turn, and as A.J. Foyt pointed out, it looked like the back end of Petty's car did just lift and come around, and Barkdahl was right behind it with nowhere to go, and it immediately went up in the air once Barkdahl hit him. There you see A.J.'s car, the black car, on the bottom of the picture. Well, that's hard memories of 1970 at Darlington 
Yeah, that's that's it. And he was he was hurt in that accident. Let's pray that he was not. He's had his neck broken several times, uh, and that's one of the uh, vulnerable parts of Richard Petty's body. And his head had to have been going back and forth in that car as it whipped over and over along the track. Well, as you'll recall, we had some uh, scenes when he tagged the wall in turn two about just how far you're in that shoulder harness and you're cinched right up in it tight, and yet his body moved, what, a foot and a half? Yeah. In those pictures that we saw Very a year ago. Elastic under now, the fence has been uh, beaten up here, and they're going to take a moment to fix it. We may be under a lengthy caution at this time in the race. That car was up in there, and the fence did what it was supposed to do, but it took some abuse, and they're going to repair it. You can see the crews out there now ready to do just that. That's the fuel cell yeah. that, that has come out of Petty's car. It was broken loose. It's amazing, you know, that the fuel cell ripped out of the car. There was no fire. That shows that the safety precautions built into these cars by NASCAR are really working. Well, that is the kind of damage that you remember from 1969 uh, with the late Don McTavish, where the front end was just yeah. as he threw the engine out. That, but a horrible thing to see. And we all, of course, the feel the same way waiting to hear and that's so optimistic what A.J. Foyt was able yes, to tell was us. Yes he was very very optimistic. We'll be back with more live Daytona 500 after this message and a word from your local stations. We're back with you live at the Daytona International Speedway alongside Ned Jarrett, Chris Iconovacchi working in the pits today. It's Mike Joy and Dave Despain. We are under caution after a major accident in turn four. Here's the latest report on Richard Petty. He has a broken right ankle, is in stable condition, and is being taken to the Halifax hospital. The other drivers involved in the incident, Alan Kowicki, Phil Barkdahl, Eddie Beerswell, Brett Bodine, and A.J. Foyt have been released from the infield medical center here at the Daytona International Speedway. Now, in further news, the, pet, the press room is reporting that no one was hurt in the grandstand area as that car rocketed along the fence. No one hurt in the grandstand area. Now let's get the story from Brett Bodine. Brett Bodine, you were among the cars that slammed into Richard Petty. Your view of what happened? Well, when I came off the fourth turn, it was just a junkyard out there, and uh, I tried to take the low line through the, through the wreck, and just as I made a... Uh, commitment to go low I cut a right rear tire down the car started turning sideways and Richard come off the wall and I just I couldn't control the car and run into him at that point there was just junk all over the place down there yeah it was just pieces laying everywhere and just unfortunate that we ended up hitting him again he'd already taken a bunch of licks before I got there and you know we just we tried to miss everything but uh, unfortunately we couldn't miss him when he come off the wall still a bit of a madhouse down here thank you Brett Phil Barkdahl also involved out there your second year a tough luck down here at Daytona first of all you're okay well I'm all right I'm, I'm sorry about the deal that happened to Richard but it, you know that's racing but I'm just very sorry about that what did you see how did it happen well, I got I don't know if I got tagged I know Richard started turning I tagged him in the back and it started it started a situation you know where he got in the wall or got upside down and got in the wall but it was we we're all bunched up there together and I don't know if he if something happened to his car but it, it, when he he slowed or turned or something anyway I, I hit him and I know I touched him in the back and started to I don't know if I started but helped the, the situation that was going on there I looked at Mary and he's upside down and I was just you know, I was worried about him more than I was worried about myself you two were right together on Thursday when he got when he got loose too is is there something about the air on the back of his car did you notice any handling problem no, with I, it? I don't think I don't think that uh, that's a deal I just think it's a deal that we're you know we're all in that in that corner together and and if, if his car got loose he'll probably have to tell you about that more than I can I'm just sorry that it happened and, and I was involved in it and the other drivers too that were running good we was running good and I know Richard was running good and but just just one of those bad deals in racing. I hope nobody got hurt in the stands. I know some stuff went up in there, but you know we're worried about that also. Word from there is that all the fans are okay, and we're going to go down pit road now to Mike Joy. Dave, we're back at the garage area with Eddie Beerswale's car. Buddy Parrott is the man with a hammer. He's the crew chief. As soon as he heard his driver was okay, he said from 500 feet away, this thing's not that bad. We can fix it and get back in the race. The damage is largely cosmetic. Let's take a look inside and see what protects these drivers from serious injury. In addition to the roll cage and the padding, new to NASCAR racing in the last couple of years is this metal seat. It's padded and vinyl covered, but even where it wraps around, this seat is designed to bend in case of an injury, an impact. And if that seat gives, the driver's bone structure doesn't have to. Eddie walked away from this crash, and he'll be back here to drive this car again if they can get it repaired. Here's David Hobbs. 
With me, I've got Alan Kulwicki, who is always involved in that accident. You didn't actually tag one of the cars. You had a cut tire, right? That's right. The accident happened ahead of us. We were slowing down. I really thought I'd make it through. I went in between two cars, but I ran over some debris and blew the right front tire out, and the car just went into the wall. Well, all your crew have descended on the car like dervishes. Are you going to try and get back in the race? Yes, we are. It, the cars hurt fairly badly. It'll never be the same, but it's a, it's a long season, and if we can pick up any points at all, it'll help later on in the season. I see they're changing suspension as well as sheet metal. I mean, how much have you got to do to the car? Well, it, it bent both of the A-frames for sure, and the, and the steering linkage and all that will have to be replaced, but we'll try to get it running, and uh, just too bad any time you wreck here. Uh, you know, the Xerox Amico 4 Thunderbird was running pretty good for us, and it's just too bad we got involved in that. Well, there's Alan Kulwicki, rookie two years ago. Let's go back up to Ken upstairs. 114 laps as they come by this time. They continue to work on the fences up here. About 20 feet of fence has been torn up by car number 53 as it went side over side along the fence. Let's go to Dave Despain. We have seen the damage to Eddie Beerschwell's car. The good news is there doesn't appear to be a whole lot of damage to Eddie Beerschwell. Yeah, Eddie, you okay? Oh, I'm okay, Dave. Yes, the car's tore up. You were right in the thick of it, apparently. Your view, your view of what happened? Well, not really. I was. I wasn't really in the thick of it. I was behind the whole thing. I had the whole thing missed, and I run over a piece of debris and cut a tire down on the Wayne Page and Oldsmobile. And when it cut, it blew the right rear. I was on the brakes hard. Left brakes grabbed, and I shot, you know, right down to Brett. Knocked Brett into Richard, and I hit Richard. So it's just a bad day for the Wayne Page and Olds. We had it really running good, and then. We had a good week, though. Well, this may be good news for you. I hear they're down there working on your car. They may think this yellow is going to be long enough to get you back out there. You wanted to go drive it a few more laps? We're ready. Yeah. Okay, well, Eddie Beerschwell says, hey, I've still got some hours left in me today. He'll head back down to his pit to check on his car in what looks like it might be an extended yellow. Again, updating, Richard Petty's condition is reported as stable, and he is suffering a broken right ankle and has been taken to the Halifax Hospital. The other drivers involved have all been released. Let's look again at what happened here moments ago at lap 106 of the Daytona 500. And Ken, Phil Barkdahl did say that he hit Petty, whether Petty had slowed a little bit, whether the car got out of shape a little bit, but once he did hit him again and it sent the car up in the air, then it got on its nose as it got against the fencing and continued to barrel roll down the track. Now here's another angle. You seven. see those snap rolls? I counted hurt. seven rollovers there uh, before the car came to rest. Uh, this crash will undoubtedly end the career of Richard Petty, I would think. I would think the pressures from his family and so forth and his medical condition. He's had half his stomach removed uh, with ulcer problems. He's had bones broken. Uh, and I would think that at 50, whatever it is, years of age, Richard Petty would... Uh, would start think, thinking seriously about retiring. What do you think, Chris, then? he might start thinking about it, but it's my opinion that we'll see him back out here again. Uh, I, I think that he'd want to prove to himself that he that he could still do it and that he could come back out. I think he wants to retire in a different way than than as a result of an accident. Let's go. Let's go right to the pits and Dave Despain. We're back at the hospital area with uh, finally an eyewitness account here regarding Richard Petty's condition. Cousin Dale Inman, you've been down this road a time or two before in this man's long career. How is he? Well, I talked to him before he, you know, just quickly stopped. And I said, how are you? I was still on the radio with him. He said, I'll talk to you when I get my breath. And uh, I, when they was putting him in the ambulance, I got there and rode in with him. And uh, he might have a broke ankle or sprained real bad. There was no compound fracture, nothing the doctor said. And they got a neck brace on him, but he's raised up and looked around with so I don't think his neck's hurt. And he's got just a little bitty scratch right there nothing but take a stitch or nothing and uh, he's alert he said he he, the, he got a little bit sideways and that Ford behind him whoever he was he said a Ford hit him and uh, then it just turned everything loose and uh, but the worst thing about it and you know nothing in here hurt he, he told the doctors he said I'm okay all in here because he's had to talk to him before I guess <laughs> but uh, they got a splint on his leg right now and uh, he might have a broke ankle I don't know but other than that he's okay and they're already speculating here. Will this end Richard Petty's career? Obviously, it's too 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 soon to answer that question based on any conscious thought. But your reaction? He's been doing this a long time. He's done everything there is to do. Does your cousin still need to be out there driving these I things? No, I mean it's up to him. He says he enjoys it, but I'm sure he didn't enjoy that ride. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens from here. But uh, they're gonna put him in the hospital. He said he, they might keep him overnight. So we'll just have to wait and see from there. But. Uh, 
uh, it was a bad one, but the car held up good, even though it come apart, and that's not bad because he's still, you know, talking. So uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Analytical viewpoint from the crew chief. Let's go down to Mike Joy. I'm with Richard Childress, the owner of the 1987 championship car driven by Dale Earnhardt. And as Dale Inman told the nation about Richard Petty's condition, Richard was relaying it to his driver. When Dale came around the racetrack after Richard had had his crash, you got a real urgent call on the radio. Tell us about it. Well, he wanted to know how Richard was. You know, he was real concerned. He said he looked like he took some hard licks, and he told me, let him know just as soon as I found out what his condition was. Did he have a view of it, or was it all well behind him? It, it was all happening on up in front of him, but he couldn't see what was happening. You know, it's a funny sport, auto racing. You guys run out and bang and bump into each other and race hard to win. But when something happens like this, the concern is, is genuine and it's shared by everybody. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all we all in competition on the racetrack, but we all the whole uh, circuit is kind of like a family and each one of us is concerned about the other. Let's go back upstairs to Ken Squire. There's Halifax Hospital. Richard Petty has just been taken to Halifax Hospital where they will work on that right ankle. What an incredible career he has had. 200 wins. He was first here for that very first race on this two and a half mile track at Daytona in 1959 when he wound up 57th. And miles covered. Take a look at that. 265,000 career miles. How far is it? Well, go around the world in that car number 43. And then a little further, considerably further. Say it's 240,000 miles to the moon and put him right there. And I'll bet you today he, he thought he was halfway there in about two and a half seconds. I can imagine because that was a wild ride. But when you see something like that and you hear his cousin Dale Inman say he'll be out of the hospital tomorrow. Maybe tonight. What a statement for how those things are constructed. That was as mean and as nasty an incident as we've seen in some time. Notice here that the, all the field is being rolled down pit road as they continue to work on that fence up here just at the entrance to the tri-oval. We'll be back with more from Daytona in a moment. One hundred sixteen laps have been completed on the track. They're working one seventeen at this moment here at the Daytona National Speedway. There is a silence over most of this crowd now. So many great fans of Richard Petty. Let's take a look at the drivers that were in the lead lap at two hundred seventy miles here. These are the competitors that were up in that first lap and still can be con considered contenders. He's look at Rusty Wallace back in 14th. He's been in and out of the pits consistently here every lap. He has not gone a lap down, but they continue to work on his car, and part of the right rear fender is missing. From the Goodyear blimp, this is the Daytona Speedway that you're seeing live for the 30th annual Daytona 500. And let's go to Dave Despain. Richard's daughter, Rebecca, had a little bit of tear in her eye there. I think she was a little upset by all this earlier. But, Lisa, you tell me that uh, things don't look so bad in there. No, they let us talk to him for about five minutes. And he said he was giving the doctors and the nurses a hard time and said he was ready to get up and get out of there. But they were going to take him to the hospital and keep him overnight, I think. Will your dad get back in a race car after this? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. Well, that answers all that speculation up top side, Ken, directly from the Petty family. Here's the 27 car of Rusty Wallace back on pit road. What's the reaction of those, those thousands that love him? Let's get a reaction from some of his fans right now. Here's David Hobbs. Well, we're right outside the Petty Transporter just a couple of hours ago, a scene of excitement and anticipation. There's a great big crowd of Petty fans here, a lot more sober and a lot more somber than those fans we were looking at earlier on amongst the motorhomes. But we just gave them the good news that Richard Petty looks like he's going to be all right just a few moments ago. And there was visible relief from a lot of these fans here gathered just outside the Richard Petty compound. And so we are still under caution and probably will be for several more minutes. At the Daytona International Speedway under caution after a six-car crash at turn four. We're back with you once again live here at the Daytona International Speedway with Ned Jarrett and Chris Economaki. I'm Ken Squire. And compare what we just saw with what happened at Talladega 
we have the rest of the race summary upcoming for you. Uh, but compare that th this incident was very similar to the Allison incident at Talladega that you alluded to that changed the complexion of motorsports. Exactly, and they both happened in essentially the same section of the track, short of the start-finish line. In each case, the cars can turn around and got off the ground rear end first. In each case, they got up against the spectator fence, and each of their accidents created very long caution periods to repair the fencing. Uh, it's, in, it's interesting that these two accidents would be uh, so similar. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. Lead changes, seven, or leaders, seven. Lead changes, 14. The average speed will be greatly reduced now, down to 155 miles per hour, and four cautions of 21 laps, and of course, that's going up considerably. 12 cars have now retired from the event after this latest incident, and those out, Morgan Shepard was the first to retire, then Mark Martin lost the engine in his new Roush car, followed by Greg Sachs' retirement, Connie Saylor brought out a caution flag, Cale Yarborough brought out a caution flag, both of those incidents up here in turn four, which has brought out the latest caution. Lake Speed has retired from the event with an engine gone, and then here are all the drivers that were in this crash at lap 106. You've heard that the Reports look pretty good on Richard Petty. The other drivers, Kowicki, Barkdahl, Brett Bodine, A.J., and Birchwell, have all been released from the medical center in the infield here at the Daytona International Speedway. So we will hold with us and see if we don't get a green flag. And I would, I think, probably in another 15 minutes, Chris. This is uh, taking some time to make sure that that fence is secure and back properly before they turn them loose. The fence did its job. No one was injured in the grandstand area. They continue to work on it. And let's go into the Dale Earnhardt feature again, uh, which was interrupted by this crash in turn number four. And the good news is that there are no serious results from it. Again, back to Dale Earnhardt. Who was your sports hero growing up? For many boys in the late 50s and early 60s, these men seemed bigger than life. But not so for young Dale Earnhardt. His sports heroes were racing drivers, men like Rex White and Jim Pascal. But his favorite driver of them all was his dad, Ralph. My father was always... Uh the best far as I was concerned and I was, you know, racing was exciting in his day and uh, I grew up around it and it just seemed to that's all there ever was to his racing. Dale Earnhardt grew up in the town of Kannapolis, North Carolina just outside of Charlotte. And they take their racing seriously in Kannapolis. The Earnhardt family home is at the corner of Coach and Sedan Streets a short block from V8 Street. Most of today's stock car drivers learned to drive on the street, and so did Dale. But he also got a lot of pointers in his own backyard. Out back was Dad's garage, where father and son spent time together working on cars. But to Mom, it seemed to be too much time. I threatened to leave his dad when he started racing. Really? And he said, uh, you know, I said, well, if you can't beat him, you have to join him sometime. Yeah. And I asked Dale, tried to get Dale not to drive, but that's that's what he wanted to do, so. It's a strong attraction, isn't it? It really is. It was born in him, I do believe. Ralph Earnhardt did not live long enough to see his son emerge as a star, but that's exactly what Dale is today. Rookie of the Year 1979, Driver of the Year 1987. Dale won 11 of 29 races last season. His approach to his sport originates with some advice he picked up from his father a long time ago. It relates to Winston Cup racing today, the patience, the uh, waiting for the right chance, uh, you know, working a man. I'm not sure about the patience, but Dale knows about working a car as well as a man. His hell for leather approach often puts him on a collision course with other drivers. A willingness to mix it up on the track has gotten him into trouble. NASCAR has levied fines and placed him on probation for rough driving on occasion, and his style has won him little support on pit road. I could have beat him, and there was no problem about it. But if, it, if a man's got to put you out to beat you, that ain't what I call racing. I don't think NASCAR would find Dale Earnhardt for what he did at Richmond. I think he'd find him for all the things he's done leading up to Richmond. Earnhardt's defenders claim he gets as much as he gives, and that his daring approach is what the fans pay to see. Flat out, hard driving, 
by a man who considers second place no place. How did he respond to the press criticisms of rough riding this past racing season? What can he say? It's, it's opinion. Someone else's. Right. Yeah. And everyone has an opinion. I think it's always been a, a positive, aggressive style of racing. I go out there with the with uh, it in my mind that we've got a, a shot at winning this race and I'm going there to try to win it. To see if Dale drives as aggressively on the city streets as he does on the tracks, I went out for a spin with him. I think I'm more alert driving on a two-lane road now I'm on the racetrack though because you never know what this other guy coming at you has been doing. So, you know, you got to be careful on the highway. You uh, break for animals, Dale? To a point. Uh, you know, you you could get in trouble. You try to avoid any danger, whether it be an animal or ever white, but if you don't, you don't hit a car head on to missing the dogs. The animal world has nothing to fear, at least as long as Dale keeps up his winning way. And for now, both Earnhardts are enjoying the benefits that come with being chosen driver of the year. It's been a long road from his Kannapolis, North Carolina upbringing to the big time. Now, Dale has finally achieved the ultimate measurement of success in America today. Well, right now, the number one is back in 14th position. He has pitted and come back on the track uh, after making a four-tire change. As the crew continues to work on the track, let's go to Ricky Rudd for a moment back there in car number 26. Ricky, you were trailing right behind that incident at turn four. Can you tell us what you saw? Well, well, I really couldn't tell exactly what triggered it. Uh, when I looked up, I saw Richard was sideways coming off turn four, and uh, right after that, somebody piled into him, and parts and cars were going everywhere. I just dove down pit road uh, across the grass to miss it. Here's a replay we're looking at from inside your car of the incident. Looked like you were absolutely blind for a moment, Ricky, coming up on that. Well, it's one of those deals, you know, uh, some, of, some of us make it through it, some of you don't. That just happened to be my day to make it through it because uh, I don't think there was a whole lot of skill involved in that. It was more luck. Well, Ricky, I think it was a good, smart move. This is Ned Jarrett. Your car don't seem to be performing quite as well as you expected it to here today. Well, we're a little disappointed with this Quaker State Buick. Uh, we've had a little bit of handling problems earlier in the week, and now it seems to be magnified by a slippery racetrack. We just haven't seemed to have gotten a handle on it. We haven't given up. We've taken this opportunity to try to make some adjustments. Thank you very much. We're still several laps away from green here. And at the moment, Ken Schrader, the pole sitter, is back in the lead. That's the first time he's led since the start. More in a moment. Let's take a look at the standings here in the 30th annual Daytona 500. Ken Schrader out of Missouri is back up in front. He was on the pole at 193 miles an hour. Phil Parsons now finds himself in second place. Harry Gant is in third. Neil Bonnet fourth. And Jeff Bodine rounds out the top five. A little further back in the field, Bill Elliott is now sixth. Terry Labonte is in seventh. Ricky Rudd is in eighth. Rick Wilson is back up to ninth, and Sterling Marlin is in the 10th position. Those are the top 10 here in the Daytona 500 with 123 of 200 laps complete, and this lengthy caution is fast drawing to conclusion. The work is about done up here on the fence. They've done a remarkable job of repair on uh, 20 feet of that chain mail fence that was damaged by Richard Petty's car number 43. Well, let's hope all the debris off the track and uh, it's slippery as uh, Ricky Rudd said. We should be going green shortly. Well, the carburetor restrictor plate, of course, has slowed the cars down, made the cars run closer together, and probably has helped to cause some of these accidents. Let's go to Mike Joy. I'm with Lou LaRosa who puts the power beneath Dale Earnhardt. Here's a cross section of the carburetor we showed you at the top of the show. The air and fuel is mixed here, flows down through the throttle plate and into the engine. Now that's all nice and neat until you slide this plate underneath with the small one inch hole and it really restricts the airflow and the horsepower, Lou. Right, it reduces airflow by about 30 uh, percent, Mike, and it cuts the horsepower by a, a third from about 600 to 400. Now, I've never heard of a driver who thought he had enough horsepower. What's Dale's reaction to all this? It doesn't bother Dale. He said we've been having 400 horsepower for the last six years. <laughs> <laughs> and now he really does. And now he does. So, uh, 
it's not bothering him too much, Mike. Uh, he's not complaining. He's holding his own. And I think we have a good shot to win this race. But you've worked with all this for the last 10 days. Has the restrictor plate put the cars closer together and maybe helped cause some of the multi-car incidents we've seen? Well, Mike, besides the horsepower, they've lost the ability to accelerate. The engine gets up to a certain RPM, and it just sits there. It won't pull away. So there's a lot of cars running equal in power, and it's hard to pull out and pass someone. That's why you're seeing some of the wrecks. And that's what's happening here today. Let's go to Dave Spain. Kenny Schrader has just brought the pole-sitting Chevrolet in this race onto pit road for a four-tire pit stop. It was exactly as planned. Two laps before the green flag came back out. That was the plan to stop Dennis Connors as the crew chief and the jack man. Everything according to strategy there. Yeah, we're right on schedule. We just wanted to stay out as long as we could so we didn't pick up any debris in the tires. Kenny started up front. He hasn't been consistently able to stay up front. Is the car working to your satisfaction? And the car satisfied him all day long. You just got to get with the right people and we hadn't been lucky enough to be able to do that so far. Are there enough of the right people left out there to win this 500? Yeah, there's plenty of right people left. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Connors, crew chief on the pole sitting car of Kenny Schrader, who will fall back into the field as a result of that pit stop. Ready to go green this time by and resume. Those? The Daytona 500. The, interesting to watch the strategy. The, the number of laps left means there's only going to be one scheduled pit stop between now and the checkered flag. So everybody got four new tires and a full tank. And they're holding that yellow flag out. Are they going to come in this time? They're going to go one more. I think they're going to go one more, Cam. Flag stand looks like they may turn them around one more. The light is back on on top of the pace car as it comes off turn number four. It had been out for a while, and we thought we were all set to turn them loose. Well, we noticed that Kenny Schrader came in for four tires. A number of the drivers have done that. After they ran through the debris out there, they wanted to be sure that they had good, fresh tires on there. They might come back and put those tires later on and put them on the car later in the race, but they didn't want to take a chance of going back under green with a cut tire. Phil Parsons is in the lead. Harry Gant is in second. Neil Bonnet is in third. Jeff Bodine is fourth. Bill Elliott is in fifth. Ricky Rudd is in sixth. Dale Earnhardt on the charge finds himself now in tenth position. There he is. And we'll want to see how fast he tries to move out here with 125 of the 200 laps down. Despite the devastating nature of this race, of the 42 starting cars, 30 are still on the track. Here's car number three, Earnhardt, looking to win the Daytona 500 for the first time. And again, it's very optimistic news about Richard Petty. He was already, in the grand traditional style, asking when they're going to let him out of the infield medical center here at Daytona. Ken, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't surprise me to see him at Richmond, Virginia, next weekend racing in that race. Not a bit. Not a bit cast on ready to go you know it's interesting they go from the 190 miles an hour here at daytona to a half a mile track next week at richmond virginia relatively flat track where they run almost 100 miles an hour slower 126 laps complete ready to go green and get with it and as we come down for the restart it will be phil parsons deployed in first in the second spot harry gant running third is neil bonnet fourth will be bodine and fifth is elliott Running in the sixth position is Ricky Rudd in seventh, Sterling Marlin. Eighth, Bobby Allison. Ninth is Dale Earnhardt. And tenth is Davy Allison. Eleventh is Dale Jarrett. Hey, the kid isn't doing half bad Not today. Not bad at all for his first Daytona 500 ever. Twelfth is Darrell Waltrip. Field ready. Now, as you note here, the lap cars are on the bottom of the track. If you're new to stock car racing, on the outside are your leaders. Harold Kinder has the flag in hand. Running 13th, Buddy Baker, 14th, Terry Labonte, 15th, Hillen on the restart. Here's the break, and as they cut loose, it is Parsons pulling away. Big jump. His brother's alongside there in the lap down car. Stacking him three and four wide. That yellow car in the very bottom is Rick Wilson trying to get back in this thing, and Phil Parsons is out in front. Meanwhile, here comes Earnhardt around Brad Teague up on Kenny Schrader three wide Michael Waltrip bottom of your picture the yellow car back straight away Darth Vader's on it uh, time to charge for Dale Earnhardt trying to get him sorted out Davy Allison coming every step of the way with Dale Earnhardt now there are those leaders there is Davy Allison along for the ride hitchhiking in the draft of car number three, Earnhardt, up on Kyle Petty. Back they come for the tri-oval. 128 complete. 
and Phil Parsons is dropped back in the lead. Harry Gant, car number 33, assumes first place. After a whole year of misery for car number 33, here's Gant leading the 500. There you see Neil Bonnet in that second spot. And who's this? Who else? Bobby Allison down at the bottom at number 12. As they go down that long 3,400 foot back straightaway, Allison cuts to the bottom of the racetrack. He nips by one. He pulls up for Bodine. Will he get him? Here comes Bonnet for the lead. Neil Bonnet. Do you think that six car accident bothered these people? Is that like it, Bonnet? Doesn't seem to be bothering him one bit right now. Here they are, back out of turn four. Down they come with Neil Bonnet now first. Into second goes Jeff Bodine in the yellow car. Back to third falls Harry Gannon just inside of him, trying to take the spot, the Buick of Bobby Allison. Side by side, the gold car of Allison, the green car of Harry Gant. Back to full song. Out of turn number two. Now look at Earnhardt coming up inside Bill Elliott. Last year's winner of the Daytona 500, number nine, Elliott, being challenged by Earnhardt. But as he came off of the turn, Elliott had the momentum, but We've now Walter has the momentum. Trouble in turn two. A lot of smoke up in turn number two, and I think we have a problem out there on Derek Cope's car. You see him spinning back up on the racetrack. He has it right him now and headed in the right direction. Caution's out. Caution is out once again. Racing to the line. At the strike. Bonnet in the front running position. Jeff Bodine in second. Bobby Allison in third. Nose bent up on Derek Cope's car. I'm not sure if that was from an earlier altercation or just then. Uh, Ricky Rudd said the track was slippery, and that looked like a case of uh, one driver just not getting the traction he needed to keep his car headed in the right direction. There Derek are still 70 laps remaining in this afternoon's event as Derek Cope from Spanaway, Washington, is down on the apron, running very slowly. A new ride for him this year, Ken. Jim Testa, the owner of that car, and see the spots are on the side of that car is one from many years back when David Pearson and the Wood Brothers had the Pure Later Company. Indeed the case. They won this race with those colors for that company. Car number 86 got tangled with Cope, they say. That would be Jeffrey, a uh, rookie in this race. Neil bought it out in front. It shattered his hip last October in a horrendous accident in Charlotte, North Carolina. The, the publicity people for his team have got x-rays of his leg showing the metal that's in there he's hobbling around and he said that the best therapy he had during his recovery period was going hunting and walking through the woods carrying a rifle going deer hunting the trip to the woods put him back in the car faster than he ever would have in a therapist shop he said we'll return to daytona for more live coverage of the daytona 500 after this word from your local station We're here at the Daytona International Speedway under caution. And don't forget, coming up next on CBS Sports, another classic matchup of what has to be the most exciting rivalry of the 80s. Larry Bird leading the Boston Celtics against Magic Johnson and the L.A. Lakers. Today, they'll meet at the Forum in Los Angeles in what may be a preview of the NBA Finals. The Celtics and Lakers coming up next right here on CBS Sports. 132 laps are down, getting ready to put this one back under green. Here are the leaders, one through 16 in the event with Neil Bonnet out in front, Jeff Bodine in second, Bobby Allison third, Dale Earnhardt fourth, Harry Gant in fifth. In the second five, Bill Elliott is there, followed by Davey Allison, Phil Parsons, Ricky Rudd and Sterling Marlin in number 44 maintains 10th. Further back, Ken Schrader is now in 11th. Rick Wilson is up to 12th, followed by Rusty Wallace, Kyle Petty, and then Buddy Baker rounds out 15th. Here's 68, Derek Cope back on pit road another time. Well, in the top five, the first and third place cars are those new downside General Motors products. Bonnet in the Pontiac and Allison in the Buick. Second, fourth, and fifth cars are those long Chevrolets of a few years old. It'll be interesting to see which of the body styles comes out on top today. Ken, let's say hello to an old friend up in Charlotte, North Carolina, Daryl Derringer, who has raced in this race many times. Daryl has cancer, our very best to him. He says, tell everybody that I'll be back here in July. He's currently under treatment for his illness. Saw a lot of races with Daryl Derringer right on this track in years gone by. Remember the 
going to the Holiday Inn across the street, see him there in his uniform, have breakfast. Big Phil, time in the old days. Phil Barkdahl apparently got wrenched about in that accident as they've decided to take him to Halifax Medical Center for a look at his back where he's complaining of some pains there. So Phil Barkdahl, the driver number 73, who was involved with Richard Petty in that wild crash a while ago, is on his way to the medical center for treatment. There were 21 laps under caution after that six-car incident that destroyed Richard Petty's automobile. We're down for a start. Here we are under green once again after the fifth caution of the day. And on the break... Neil Bonnet's out in front. Raymock Racing Team have their colors on the point. There's Connie Saylor down on the inside, that number 95, Canadian driver, trying to get back in this thing. That's Trevor Boyce. I'm sorry, I mean Trevor Boyce. Connie Saylor was in the 99. Here's Davy Allison looking back at Phil Parsons from the bumper. That thing looks awesome coming towards you, doesn't it? Looks like it's going to eat you up. Yeah, it looks like some sort of shark. Jaws right there. Phil Parsons, number 55, falling back just a little from Davey Allison now. Ground level coverage at 190 miles per hour. Live on CBS Today, as you're looking out of Davey Allison's car, running in seventh position at the eighth position runner, Phil Parsons. And out of the front, he has his hands full with Bill Elliott. Ford against Ford there. Here's Davey trying to outside, working that draft. All important, that cushion of air that comes like the wake off a boat and ripples up off that concrete. And that's where the veterans, the experienced drivers, can see that magic barrier. And they can do just incredible things with a race car. Here's Parsons, Phil, back up another time on Davy Allison. Ken, we see them coming up on Eddie Beerswall, who has gotten back in the race. He was one of those cars that was involved in the Richard Petty accident, but he's running much slower now. Coming by to complete 135 laps, and Neil Bonner stays out in front by two car lengths. For a passing flag out in some of the slower cars. Here's Bodine looking like he wants to take a shot. Pretty late in the going. They may want to hold on to things. I would think Allison, if he has it, Bobby, in the number 12 car, running third, would like to wheel around and get out in front, much like Darrell Waltrip described earlier. Get away from that field. And here comes Earnhardt in fourth spot, that number three. Earnhardt is measuring Allison. He's watching him very carefully. Earnhardt has been a very conservative driver today. I'm just starting this new season with a new sponsor. He's in a black uniform. He's not the colorful swashbuckling driver he was a year ago, but look at him now on the inside underneath Bobby Allison going for second. Yeah, Allison picks up a spot. Earnhardt picks up one, and he may watch the lead here. Got a man drafting with him, which I think is Dave Marcus, a lap down. Back they come to the trioval before a record crowd here at Daytona in the 30th annual 500 live on CBS. They muscle their way down into turn number one with Bonnet and Allison, one, two, the Alabama gang, first and second, and Davey Allison being shown in seventh. Earnhardt up to third. Back straight away. 190 miles per hour into turn number three. Bonnet with the lead. Let's see if Allison takes a shot at the lead right here on Neil. Neil Bonnet was taught how to drive by the man that's right behind him now, Bobby Allison. Look at Ken Schrader in a draft with car number 17, Darrell Waltrip pulling through traffic. Darrell has been down there several times on the inside. He finally has someone to go with now, so he's able to pick up some speed. Meanwhile, up in front, Bobby Allison goes for the lead, gets it. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. In our live coverage of the 30th annual Daytona 500, after 350 miles, there have been 10 leaders, lead changes 19, and the average speed after a lengthy 21-lap caution, 131 miles per hour. Five cautions, 34 laps, 11 cars have retired. And those cars out of the Daytona 500, Morgan Shepard, Mark Martin, Sachs, Sailor, Kelly Yarborough crashed, Lake Speed lost an engine, and then Richard Petty, Kowicki, Barkdahl, Bodine, and Foyt. And as to what happened here a few moments ago, this is what happened in turn four. Richard Petty, perhaps a little loose, tagged by Phil Barkdahl, and then this terrible series of sidewinders down out of the fourth corner. As bad as this looks, 
and it gets worse if this is the first time you're looking at it. He's about to be solidly hit here by Brett Bodine in another moment. He is reported to have only a broken right ankle in stable condition, conscious, talking and arguing with the folks at the hospital about when he's going home. Now, this race for the lead, Ken and Ned, is the drivers generally agree that you can't do anything without some help from one or more other drivers. They're going to have to get help. Ned, exactly what does the help consist of and how precise must it be? Well, I think Daryl Waltrip is getting help from Buddy Baker right now, and certainly Buddy is getting help from Daryl. They're able to pull away just a little bit from the third-place car. You can see the interval there, but Earnhardt coming back up very strong. But what they mean by getting help is the front car burst the air open. The other one can run in his draft, pick up the RPMs, and pick up his speed. So it does help both cars. What about a third car? There's some drivers say, well, if two of us had help, then we go better. Is that one behind the other? Yeah, I, I think three cars can run a little bit better, but once you go beyond that, then I think that it begins to slow everybody down a little bit. Take a look at those leaders. Waltrip is first. Baker, who ran the fastest 500 in the history here of Daytona at 177 miles an hour in 1980, is second. Then Earnhardt is closing again in third. Davy Allison, the youngster, is leading his father. Davy Allison is fourth. Bobby Allison is in fifth. And Neil Bonnet is back to sixth. Elliott's in seventh. Bodine is in eighth. Terry Labonte is in ninth. Sterling Marlin, tenth. Rusty Wallace, eleventh. Schrader is in twelfth. Parsons, thirteenth. Rick Wilson in 14th, and they're all contenders. They're all in that lead line. And here's Bobby Allison passing his son to move into fourth place. This is going to be some finish. It may be. We haven't seen that many lead changes. The record shows a lot more of that kind of thing, but for drama and suspense and last moment excitement, Chris, this one looks like it may be better than anything we've seen in the 29 previous. Within the next 15 laps, the final pit stops are going to come up, and the pit crews are going to be under extreme pressure to get their men in and out because they're the ones that are going to win and lose, perhaps, for their drivers. Darrell Waltrip, how does it feel to be one of the favorites to win the 500 today? Well, it's certainly a, a pleasant change. Uh, I've been down here so many times when they talk about people that could win this race and uh, had never had my name mentioned. And uh, this time, it's, it's just been a whole different week for me. Uh, the car qualified well. I knew after qualifying, I said, man, if this thing will run this fast qualifying, I'm going to be really good in the race. And uh, I said that on a number of occasions. I think it's going to be Sunday uh, today, just like it was uh, in the qualifier. I think I can get out front and sit there and just let them chase me. Chasing is what they're doing right now. Baker is there. Here comes Earnhardt. Chevy, Chevy, one and two. And then car number 88 stays right there in third spot. Buddy Baker's Oldsmobile hanging on on the outside. And here comes, and they touch! Baker nailing Earnhardt or vice versa. Here they are back in the tri-oval. Over 100,000 in these grandstands coming to their feet as they saw that. The infield being told about it on the radio, and everybody is buzzing about that moment. Here they are still, wheel to wheel, out of two. Earnhardt low, Baker high. And Baker senses that this could be his day to win the Daytona 500. And here's Allison dropping all the way down on the apron, wheeling through cars. One car, Eddie Pierce wheel, running very slowly. And they just snow plow over him. It's not the, the, the drivers. Can have got their feet to the floor. They're asking everything from the engine it can give. There's no breathing. They're all going to have leg cramps when this day is over. Dale Earnhardt got a leg cramp in 20 laps in the clash that you saw last Sunday here on CBS as he went on to win from just leaving his foot flat up against the firewall. Well, you can imagine 500 miles of that kind of pressure here today. There's Waltrip. You see his advantage. Bobby Allison now in second, and guess who's in third? His son, Davey Allison. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Pulling up on the rear. Here comes Bobby Allison for the lead, and you're watching it from Davey Allison's car. Going to turn three. Bobby Allison takes command. And every Alabama spectator is waving here at the track. Here's Davey trying the outside. Darrell Waltrip down low. Well, what Darrell Waltrip wanted to be out in front and run by himself, forget it. Well, Bobby knows how to handle this car. He knows how to handle Darrell Waltrip. The question is, will he be, have the quality and the speed to do it when it's all over with? 
A little over 100 miles to go. Father first, son third, Waltrip sandwiched in between at 190 miles an hour. How does it feel, Bobby Allison, to race with your son? Well, I think it's neat, and there are a lot of pluses, and there are a few drawbacks to the thing, too. Um, Davy is a delight to be around for me. Uh, I'm very proud of him. Uh, I enjoy his company. I enjoy his, uh, his effort, personal effort, and, and his racing activities. Um, and it's, it's a real thrill for me to see him do well. On the other hand, I have the concern that I think any father would have for their, their son, you know, whether it's a quarterback running in there and all those big guys jumping on him, or whether you're out there in a race car and, and uh, you know, you have the uh, potential for some sort of danger. Uh, but there's a third thing that comes into, into my picture, too, when this father and son thing with Davey. And uh, he's a real competitive pain. Uh, you know, he's another guy out there that, that really is a, a p potential winner. And uh, actually uh, had two wins last year to my one. And, you know, is fast in the car, uh, has a fast car, and he's fast in it. So uh, he's a, a, a big threat competitively. So it's a triple deal for me, not just a double one. <laughs> That competitive pain is riding just about two car lengths behind his father. Most recent time, we had a father and son combination finish first and second in a Winston Cup race. July 1960, Lee Petty winner, Richard Petty second. And the only other time it happened was July 1959. Richard Petty flagged the winner of a 100-mile sweepstakes race. The old Lakewood Speedway in Atlanta, Georgia. Lee finished second but protested the finish, and uh, his son, was set back a spot. Here comes Waltrip down to the inside. Darrell Waltrip in a snarl for first position. 157 laps complete. Here's Davey Allison's view of this struggle for supremacy in the 30th annual Daytona 500. Now they're pulling away from the fourth place and the rest of the cars behind them. This tremendous duel. We'll see now who has the muscle. Incredible pictures. Now here's Earnhardt trying to move around Buddy Baker. That's the fight that's going on for fourth. Baker on the inside, Earnhardt on the outside. Interesting mix of cars up in those front positions. And there is number 75 right in. There's Elliott in the picture. And that's the battle that's going on for third. You're in for a remarkable finish in motorsports today in the great American race, the Daytona 500. Baker putting Earnhardt right to the wall as they continue to struggle for third spot. We'll be back with more of the action shortly from Daytona. From the Goodyear blimp, this is the view at the Daytona International Speedway, where right now the leader is pulling on pit road. Bobby Allison's car is in the pits. It is gas only for Bobby Allison. They didn't even look at the tires. Allison was last here on lap 120. Could have perhaps gone a little longer, but with one stop, each driver can go the distance. Allison one's in on the last round of pit stops. Now most of the teams came in at lap 107 and should be in about this time. The question mark, the next 27 laps after that were run under the caution flag, so nobody really knows exactly how far they'll be able to run under the green without stopping. 162 laps are complete, so we're into the last 100 miles, and there is a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle for the lead between Davey Allison and Darrell Waltrip, and Allison for the moment has the lead. We see leaders pitting. Bodine is coming in, Elliott is coming in, Earnhardt all on pit road at this time. There you see that trio. One car coming in very slowly. That's Benny Parsons. Apparently he ran out of gas or something happened to his car. He's going on back into the garage area. So the Parsons green. retires. That's the, seven, uh, the 11th car out of the race. It's amazing, none of these cars are taking on tires, just gasoline. Earnhardt back on. Elliott back out. They were from 12 and a half to 15 seconds. Bobby Allison was in for 14 and a half seconds when he took on gas. Davy Allison pitting right now. Here's Davy Allison on pit road. Let's go to Dave to Spain for this crucial pit stop. With three cars running up front together, the question is when do you pit? The decision has been made. Davy is on pit road. 
the crew chief on the car. Robert Yates elected to let Bobby Allison come in alone and then to try to pit with Daryl. Then, moments later, they changed that decision. They said, let's go, let's bring him in. Davey Allison has come on pit road and quickly back underway. That really shows you how they do cover the terra firma as he comes back on the track. Davey Allison's number 28. It didn't look like Davey took two tanks of fuel. He was on a, a short period of time. I wonder if he got enough gas. Perhaps our pit reporter can check. Kyle Petty on pit road. And away. Well, John Walter was still milking that gas tank on number 17. <laughs> He was one of the last drivers to pit on that long caution, so he had topped it off and put every bit of gas in there that he could possibly get. There's second place, number 88, Baker, and third place is number 75, Neil Bonnet. That means that in fourth place is number 27, Rusty Wallace. Let's go to Dave Despain. More on the timing of the pit stop from Robert Yates, crew chief for Davey Allison. We talked about staying out until Darrell came in and decided not to. Do you not have as long a legs as he does? Well, no, we could have run to lap 175. Bobby's crew said they were going to pit on 161, but it's important that we stay with the car that we run quick with, and uh, we just went ahead and decided to go ahead and get in here since Earnhardt and Bill and, and Bodine all came in. You didn't get much gas in that car. Did you get in enough gas? Well, we put in uh, what we think could make the distance. Uh, Ford Thunderbird gets really good fuel mileage. You better hope so. <laughs> Robert Yates with, with a splash of gas hoping to make her to the finish. Especially when Robert Yates gets through working on the engine. He is an expert at that. Oh, game. he is indeed. He is absolutely one of the best. And here is the product of his development car number 28, Davey Allison, finding his way back up toward the front in the Daytona 500. After 166 of 200 laps, Darrell Waltrip was out in front on his way, hopefully, to his first Daytona 500 victory. Buddy Baker trying to repeat for a second time. Neil Bonnet running third. Rusty Wallace back to fourth. Ken Schrader to fifth. He has just pitted. Then Terry Labonte was in sixth. Sterling Marlin was in seventh. Florida's Rick Wilson in eighth. Bobby Hillen in ninth. And Dale Jarrett was up into the tenth position, having an outstanding day for Dale. Now there's the number 11 car, and that is Terry Labonte. Directly in front of him, the second place car of Rusty Wallace. That's the Junior Johnson, number 11. They had thin pickings last year. They're trying to get things together. And here comes the master of the economy run, number 17, Darrell Waltrip, still stretching out that tank. Mike Joy has more from the Waltrip pit. A big conference going on right here as to when they will pit Darrell Waltrip. Mike Powell is the gas man. You know what you've got to do. You're the guy that can win this for your team. You can fuel that car quickly. Yeah, it'll have to be. We'll have to not make any mistakes this time. So if everything goes good and we get this can in, we get the other one plugged in and go, then, you know, it ought to, it ought to be pretty good. So. The big question, when will you bring them in? Well, I'm not sure. Jeff hadn't said yet. So, you know, we'll, it'll be within the next few laps, I think. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to get ready, okay? They let all their drafting partners stop without him. Rusty Wallace coming in right now. Jeff Hammond still working the computer, trying to figure gas mileage. The longer they wait to keep Waltrip out on the track, the less time he has to stay at rest while they put gas in. Then we have to put maybe one and a half cans in or one and a quarter cans in with the mileage in, and that's going to be the difference. Sixth place, Ricky Rudd is on pit road right now. Here with him. You saw Marlin pit in the number 44 car, and Rusty Wallace was in. Waltrip leading Allison by about 36 seconds. Here's Rudd away. Boy, it's a little dusty down there today. We gave you the uh, we gave you the top 10. Let's take a look at the rest of the field at this juncture. Here's how they were. The rest of the field behind the top 10 in at 11 at 400 miles. That's how they were running. Ball trip stays out in front. Dale Jarrett is just pitting number one right now. And he had gotten on the board for the first time ever in the Daytona 500. Ken had moved up to fifth place before he made that pit stop. How's that make a father feel? Good. <laughs> He gets a clean windshield, fill him up with some gas, and change the angle on the spoiler a little bit, and send him on his way. He's determined to be a three-time champion, just so he has one up on old dad. <laughs> he has a long way to go. He does <laughs> want to do it really bad. And to win 50 times, as you did? Well, it looks a little like his father. 
Do you ever have a mustache, Ned? No. <laughs> Martha wouldn't let me. <laughs> Back on the track with car number 17, the leader. I'd like to hear from Jeff Hammond and just a win. He intends to bring that rascal in. They're waiting, of course, for a yellow flag. That would make things a lot easier. But uh... he might be coming in this. No, yeah. he just runs down low on that racetrack anyway. For those of you tuning in for NBA basketball, our race is running long because of the delay resulting from the Richard Petty crash here at Daytona today. NBA will tip off at 345, and we expect this race to conclude at about 350. We'll stay here at Daytona to conclusion and thereafter join the NBA game in progress. Here's Terry Lavani on pit road at number 11. Quick stop for fuel. And he'd been up to second place. Sterling Marlins, number 44. He is pitted. And there's Mike Waltrip running directly in front of his brother, Darrell Waltrip. Mike Waltrip's having a very good run in that car, which was rented for him. Here's uh, David Hobbs back in the garage area. David? Well, in the closing stage of this race, I'm down in the spot where Richard Petty had that horrendous crash just a few laps ago. And there's no doubt that the new super fence did its job, instigated in part by Bobby Alger's crash last year at Talladega. However, this huge crowd here has gone through some tremendous mood changes today. Speaking as a driver, I know the gut-wrenching feeling I felt when I was down at the hospital and Richard Petty got wheeled in on the stretcher. You feel absolutely desperate, and I think that most people that come to these races come to see the skill and the undoubted daring that these drivers possess. They do not come to see injury. And the crowd went very, very quiet. But since the restart, this has been an incredibly electrifying race, and this crowd has responded in likewise. This is an electrified crowd, and this is going to be one heck of a finish down here at Daytona 500 for the 30th time. Back to Mike Joy in the pits. Here is Daryl Waltrip. The man is trying to win this race. Jeff Hammond has the signboard, steps out of the way. He's talked to each of these men individually and called in the play. Mike Powell in the blue goggles, dumping in that first can of gas. They only need half for that second can. A gallon, two, maybe three, and Waltrip is away trying to win his first Daytona 500. When Waltrip came to the pitch, he had a 36-second lead on Bobby Allison right here. Crash in the corner. It is, it is Harry Gant's car that is wrecked just after Waltrip made that pit stop in turn two. An 11-second pit stop by Darrell Waltrip. Harry Gant, it sure looks like he cut a tire down or got hit by someone. Never see him lose. He's still firing it up and trying to get it out of there. Harry Gant, number 33, crashing on lap 176 of 200 in the Daytona 500. Now we might see the leading drivers come back in the pits and get tires, and as Bobby Allison likes to put it, rebuild the car for the drive to the checker. There'll be no rebuilding the Hal Needham car, the Burt Reynolds Hal Needham number 33, savaged in turn number two in the sixth caution of the day here in the Daytona 500. There is some of the debris on the speedway. You run over that, you're gonna be in tire trouble. He certainly will, and most of them will come in, I think, can and take on four tires. In fact, Darrell Waltrip is coming back into the pits right now. So this is the break they were all looking for. It is the misfortune of Harry Gant that may cast an entirely new look on the finish of the Daytona 500 this year. We may finally have that three-car assault across the line to decide the 500, similar to what we saw in 1959. But in that year, one car, Joe Weatherly, was a lap down when Lee Petty and Johnny Beauchamp rushed to the line, and they took three days to decide who finally won that race in a photo finish, back when photo finishes aren't quite what they are today. Well, Davey Allison just won the race out of the pits. He beat Darrell Waltrip. Darrell going down pit, pit road, following. And Waltrip and, and Allison and uh, Davey Allison each got four tires. So they're ready to go now with fresh tires and the cars are all hepped up for the drive to the checker. Replay on Harry Gant as he struggles crab-like to get back on pit road, nailing the wall, solidly front end, back end after such a brilliant run today. You know, the knock has been on Gant because they didn't win last year, but he won three grand national races. You just have to feel so badly for these drivers that try so hard, and then this kind of thing happens when you can almost sense that the finish is in the air and you'll have a good day. Yeah, it's really too bad. We'll be back for the finish of the Daytona 500 
shortly. We are under caution for the sixth time today in the 30th running of the Daytona 500. One of them a very lengthy stop or hold because of this terrible accident that Richard Petty had earlier this afternoon. The car number 43 of Petty was totally destroyed and there was some time to repair the fence in the turn four area of the track. And the man who's won 200 races 50 years old had just a terrible crash here today. Let's take a look at exactly what happened as they were coming out of turn four. His car just lifted. The back end got loose. He was tagged by Phil Barkdahl. The car went up in the air and then started a barrel roll, got up against the outside retaining wall and the fence. Now all this at about 190 miles an hour. There's what hurt when Brett Bodine ran into the side of him and broke his right ankle. Uh, he's okay. He's talking. His condition is stable. He's at the Halifax Hospital here in Daytona. But look at this. And they, the drivers will tell you they don't worry nearly as much about rolling over as they are concerned about coming to a halt like this and then being collected by another car at over 100 miles an hour. And it was interesting that so many of the cars that wrecked behind him or wrecked in there to him ran over some of the debris and cut a tire, which threw them out of control. Again, the report is very optimistic on Richard Petty. He's conscious, talking, has a broken ankle. And the, question, the only question is, will he go to Richmond to race next Sunday? Unbelievable. 181 laps complete, less than 50 miles to go. 17 cars in the lead That's lap. That's it, 17 cars on the lead lap. That is really remarkable. But the speed is down to 137 miles per hour. Now, the record's 176. Well, we had a half-hour hold under yellow there. You know, there are going to be people who don't like the restrictor plates, and there are going to be people who do like them. They have 17 cars in the lead lap at the finish of a 500-mile race like this. That's remarkable. As we get set for the restart, here's how the cars are deployed. Bill Parsons is in first. Perched on his rear bumper is Davey Allison, second. Waltrip, third. In fourth is Bobby Allison. In fifth is Buddy Baker. In sixth, Dale Earnhardt. Seventh is Terry Labonte. Going eighth is Ken Schrader. Ninth is Sterling Marlin. Tenth is Rusty Wallace. Eleventh, Bodine out there. Then twelfth is Neil Bonnet. Bill Elliott is back in thirteenth. Ricky Rudd is in fourteenth. And Dale Jarrett is in fifteenth. Showing in the uh, 16th position is Bobby Hillen, and in 17th position, Rick Wilson, all in the lead lap. 17 cars to decide the Daytona 500 this afternoon. And it'll be 18 laps to go when they take the green flag. Phil Parsons brings them down. His best 500. More than a quarter of the starters, more than 25% of the starters have led this race, 12 and 42. Here they are on the break, coming to the line. On the break, Phil Parsons steady into turn one. Davy Allison there, Waldrop in third. I would think Waldrop's confidence level is very, very high. Look, right down Here the bottom Allison. of the track. Put on their best set of tires, fill them up with gasoline, and here comes Bobby Allison, two of the fastest cars we've seen during speed weeks here. Allison gonna make a move for it. The winner of the 125-mile qualifiers, Allison and Waltrip, go for it. That's gonna be a psychological blow to Waltrip. We'll see. Here he is on the outside trying to take some room back. Davy Allison gets into it. Three cars for the Llewell. Where Davy Allison at? is, he's helping Darrell. Yeah, he's Father than his father. Him. Yeah, when he moves up there, that helps Darrell a little bit, but maybe Davy's car won't work down low, but Bobby's doing okay on his own. Davy Allison goes out in front, still even. And there's the view from Davy Allison of this battle for the Daytona 500. Now he's down giving Dad a boost. <laughs> and Dad takes advantage of it. Gets out in front by about four feet. Waltrip comes back, but no. These two cars in the bottom of the track look like they're gonna go home. Well, Davey's a key right here as to who's gonna lead this race. As and to who he gets behind. By staying behind his father, he pulls up. He goes to second. Dad goes out in front. Waltrip falls to third. And Darryl Waltrip needs to get that new daughter, Jessica, out here in the car right off. So long, Daddy. Look at Bobby go. Bobby Allison's wife, Judy, looking on here. 
pretty excited. Trouble on pit road. Earnhardt is in. Dale Earnhardt in number three. Poles on pit road. Something to miss there. Apparently a tire went down on the car. So once again, the effort by Earnhardt to turn it around and win this race will come up short. Had so many late race troubles here at Daytona. It's unbelievable. Never having taken the 500. An excellent pit stop, Ken. Less than 12 seconds for the Richard Childers crew to change that tire. He'll stay in the lead lap. Earnhardt's been here since 1970. Still trying to win 79 and trying to win it. Ran out of fuel in 86 when he thought he had it in his pocket and Jeff Bodine came home. Jeff Bodine felt differently. Stevie Waldrop. Mother of five month old Jessica looking on. From behind Davy Allison's car. That's what you see, and Waltrip is falling further back, as you see. Yes, he is. Darrell Waltrip in, is falling back. Baker pulling up. Parsons pulling up. Now, and Davy's going to take on his father before this one is over. It'll be interesting to see how he handles Dad. I think he would like to sit there for a little while and try to pull themselves away from the rest of the field, but Buddy Baker is having nothing to do with that. He wants to pull back up on him. Yeah. Buddy Baker was the one who apparently got Davey Allison into the wall uh, yesterday in the late practice section. For those of you tuning in for NBA basketball, our race is running long because of the delay resulting from the Richard Petty crash. The game is underway, and we expect this race to conclude at about 4 o'clock. We'll stay here at Daytona to conclusion, and thereafter join the Celtics Lakers contest from Los Angeles in progress. There you see the interval between that pack of five automobiles running for the lead. And as they stand now, it's Bobby Allison in first, Davey Allison in second. How about this? Buddy Baker in third, Phil Parsons in fourth. And as they come to the line, a caution. caution is coming out. A caution is on the track. Debris somewhere on the racetrack. They say there's some metal or something on the racetrack, and they want to bring them in. That Thir brings out the seventh caution of the day. Thirteen laps remain. Turn four is where they say the debris is. Break for Dale Earnhardt. He didn't lose a lap a moment ago. Had to make that unscheduled pit stop, but now he'll get to catch back up. If you want to see the fur fly, keep your eye on Earnhardt with... 187 of 200 laps complete as he'll try to charge up through here. I can't imagine anyone leaving their TV set at this point because he'll, it is going to be some kind of exciting. He'll take any kind of hold he can find to get himself any kind of position on the finish. Ken, I think this will be a break for Darrell Waltrip, too. It'll be interesting to see if he makes a pit stop. He had dropped back to about 10th position. There's the medal that was on the debris that was on the racetrack as one of the workmen picks it up. It was right in the groove as they come off a of turn four, especially those that would be coming off low. I gave that workman a 6.2 on that re-entry to the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Think anybody out in the back of this group will uh, take a moment in here to do anything with their car? Certainly nobody up front will. The issue is some of those guys like yeah. Wilson in the back. Ricky Rudd will pit. Rudd is coming on pit road and we'll take this break and then be back for the finish. Dick, the lights are about to go out for 16 guys here. There's 17 in the lead lap. There are 189 laps complete, 11 laps to go. Grant Knowlton, Halifax Hospital, reports on Richard Petty, no broken bones. Repeating, no broken bones. Quote by Petty to the doctors and nurses down there, hey, if there was a long enough caution flag, maybe we could get back and finish the race. How about that? <laughs> He'll be at Richmond next Sunday. You bet. But not in that car. That's about as badly as we've seen the car beaten up in a long time. Here are the standings. 188 of 200 laps complete. Allison's Allison first and second. Buddy Baker now third. Parsons fourth. Labonte fifth. Second five. Bonnet, Schrader, Marlin. And there's Waltrip back in tenth. And Dale Earnhardt in 15th position. He did move up to the back of the pack. Let's see him come through. You know he's going to. Well, you know it's going to be exciting up front for my nickel. I'd love to watch Earnhardt for a while. He's He's going to be something as they come out. Ten to go. Ten to go. There's Earnhardt's car, the number three. 
Trying to get a report on Harry Gant's car on the number 33, if we can, from the pits. It's exactly what happened to Harry out there. That was a hard crash on Harry Gant earlier. But it took out the Halby number one. Under green. Back for the finish. Ten laps. It's a sprint. 25 miles to decide it all this afternoon for a million and a half bucks. Bobby Allison goes out in front. Davy Allison in second. Pulling up in the back straightaway. Getting to full speed. Bobby Allison jumps out in front by eight car lengths. Now down to two car lengths, Chris. That's good. Heavy traffic back there. There's no room for the drivers who have the power to get through. Baker won't let go. Baker is a master at drafting, and he likes high-speed racetracks. He loves the Daytona International Speedway. Has a lot of miles here. Buick first, Ford second, Oldsmobile <laughs> running in third, Chevrolet fourth. And you talk about product mix. Hello. Here they are, back to the line. Nine laps to go. Davey is right on his father's back bumper. He's not letting him pull away this time. Well, he said right along, if I ever got the chance, the one guy I want to be is my dad. He'll never be prouder. I don't know how his mother her husband Judy's going to feel about that, but they're down to it. Father and son. First and second, Daytona 500. What a remarkable race it is. Richard Petty is all right. He'll be back in level cross tonight. And here comes Baker. Buddy Baker mixing it up. What a great racing family. His dad, a great champion for many years, goes into second. He Boy. really made a quick move into that third turn. Some power there. Odine running side by side further back, I believe, with Bill Elliott as they come back to the strike. Indeed, that's the case. There you see them still side by side. And eight laps to go. Yeah. Buddy's All measuring Bobby now. All right, experts. They say experts are local boys away from home. Mr. Economaki from Ridgewood, New Jersey. How do you feel about the decision on this one? Well, I don't know. The owner of that number 88 car is a neighbor of mine. My emotions are mixed here. I picked Bobby Allison to win. Getting down to the finish. Guess who's going to be back here to see it? Richard Petty has been released from the hospital. He's on his way back to the track after that terrible crash. Judy Allison looking on. Status right now as they come down out of turn four. Unbelievable. Look what happened to Baker when he got out of line. He's back to the it. lead comes Bobby Allison seeking his third Daytona 500 win. Into second, his son, and then Phil Parsons is back to third, and Baker has fallen all the way back in that draft. Boy, if you get out of the line, you certainly can go back in a hurry. It's remarkable here. Position is everything. Back straight away to the inside. Parsons taking a shot and moving up through. Boy, Phil Parsons is having an excellent run in this Daytona 500. Phil Parsons has only been in four previous races. His best finish, 11th twice. Now running in third, but he could be back to 11th or 14th at any moment in this crowd. Six laps to go, this time by. Nobody sitting down. It's turning into a dream race here in the Daytona 500. Less than 90 seconds ago, Buddy Baker was trying for the lead. He's back in 11th place now. Well, it doesn't take long once you get out of line. They'll just motor right on by you with the freight train. Again, repeating the good news is Richard Petty, after a disastrous crash in which he rolled over some seven times in turn number four, has been released from the hospital here in Daytona Beach. And the Grand Master, the King, is on his way back to the Daytona track where he won this race seven times. No one's come close. Cale Yarbrough won it four. Cale crashed today as well, if you're just joining us. And now we're down to this finish. Five laps to go. The Alabama gang. Out in front. Bobby first, Davey second. Phil Parsons doing beautifully. And let's not discount the number 11 driven by Terry Labonte. And there's the number 17 of Waltrip back in there trying to find some way to get sorted out but time is running out for him it's a 13 car draft for this win here but it looks as though bobby allison is absolutely in control and he's got a defender on his back bump. there's labonte lur lurking fourth and then bonnet back there in fifth as the laps run down <laughs> Davy Allison said the other day, I keep getting taught valuable lessons. And I want
want to keep them to myself. <laughs> if I could pass three or four cars in the corner, that's where I'd get stopped. I couldn't get back in line after I passed three or four cars. He says, we can't pass anyone on the straightaways. There's not many people here who can, so you can look for him to make a move, I would say, going to three on his father. On the last lap. On the last lap. Well, no, I don't think he'll drive before then. The problem, though, if he makes a move on his father, doesn't make it, he'll drop to third because whoever's right behind him will take second place. Yeah, but who cares about second? Well, they all care about one spot, and here it comes. There'll be three laps to go this time by. Here's how they run across the line. Allison, Allison, Phil Parsons, Terry Lavati, Neil Bonnet. In six, Ken Schrader, Rusty Wallace in seventh, Sterling Marlin in eighth, Davey, or rather Darrell Waldrop in ninth, Buddy Baker in tenth now, Bill Elliott, last year's winner in eleventh, and Dale Earnhardt back inside of Davey Allison's car as we get down to the side it this afternoon. You're riding with the second place campaigner, the Harry Rainier Lundy car. That team won it twice with a CBS onboard camera with Cale Yarborough driving. Rainier, you saw him in those pictures earlier at the car, brushed the wall in turn two late yesterday. They worked through the night, got it back together. It's running second. Here they come to the stripe. And there are two laps remaining. Five miles. Here you are with Davey Allison in that second position. Bobby Allison stays up in front. And they're beginning to mix it up back there at the back of that pack. All of those drivers battling for position as well. There's some extra pickings further back, and that Bobby Allison is doing what he predicted he would do run this car hard and keep it out in front. Davy Allison, not relinquishing anything to his father, stays right with him. Judy Allison looking on as her husband and her son battle it out in a million and a half dollar great American race. Out of turn number four, here's Bobby Allison, the two time champion. What must be going through his mind right now? Here's the white silk from Harold Kinder. Last lap. Parsons lies third. Texas Terry Labonte is in fourth. Neil Bonnet, the third member of that Alabama gang, back in fifth. And those two leaders draw away a bit. Davey Allison coming after his father. Looks down inside as they take it high in turn number two. Back straight away, final time to decide it all here this afternoon. Now, Davey, what are you going to do? He's got less than half a lap to do. And they have enough lead, and I believe this is going to be a battle between the father and son. I don't think anybody Davey. else can try it, but here he comes. He's going to do the it. bottom. He's down low. Bobby Allison high. Davey Allison trying the inside move. Bobby Allison holds him off. They come to the stripe, and the winner of the 30th annual Great American Race, Bobby Allison. Davey Allison, his son in second. Judy Allison is static. What a tremendous family performance. Look at him, David Bobby waving to Davey. <laughs> I went down low and ran slow, but he was too strong. <laughs> Did you hear Davey saying, I made a try for him at turn four, but he was too strong. Well, those fans of David Hobbs interviewed at the first of the race said, I think it'll be the Alabama gang. Here they are. The Alabama gang has conquered the Daytona 500 in its 30th running. Stock car folks will tell you that their sport is a family game. The Daytona 500 has certainly been that as we see the final standings. Bobby Allison being pushed into victory lane. Mike Joy is standing by. There are the top five. Here comes the winner. Bobby Allison for the third time in his career, averaging 137 miles an hour. Let's go to Mike Joy standing by with the winner. Bobby Allison, three Daytona 500s and a father-son finish. Oh, man, I'll tell you, the Stavola brothers, Miller Buick, really ran good. I'm telling you, Mike, what a thrill for me. What a thrill. I'll tell you, these guys have just been great for me. Uh, Jimmy Finnegan, and Keith Ullman. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, uh, my parents are a, a real inspiration to me. And um, I'll tell you, it's just been a great day. Your sister watching at home, lying ill, your son right behind you and riding alongside on that victory lap. What could be better than this? I'll tell you, that was great. And Davey did such a great job, especially after getting the car wrecked so bad yesterday at the end of practice. 
Uh, I got to give a lot of credit to the whole Rainier crew, and uh, I'll tell you, Davey did a great job. And so did you. Congratulations, Bobby Allison. Back upstairs to Ken Squire. It's a big day for the seniors, the first winner over 50 years of age. Bobby Allison, the leader of the Alabama game. For Chris Economaki, Ned Jarrett, David Hobbs, Dave Despain, and Mike Joy, I'm Ken Squire saying so long from the Daytona International Speedway. The Daytona 500 has been a presentation of CBS Sports.